Welcome, and this is the National Capital Planning Commission's December 3rd, 2015 meeting. Thank you. Uh, please be advised that today's meeting is being live streamed on the ncpc.gov uh, website. Uh, we do have a quorum, and so uh, without objection, we will proceed uh, with the agenda as has been publicly noticed. Um, item number one is report of the chairman, and I'd quite simply like to acknowledge uh, Commissioner Howie Dennis, um, and today is his last meeting with us. Um, he has served here since 2011. Right yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is his, uh, he's, he's been with us since 2011 as the alternate for Chairman um, Issa, and since then with Chairman Chaffetz. And uh, we thank you for your service, and we will miss you. Yep, indeed. Um, agenda item number two is a report of the executive director, Mr. Costa. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. In the interest of time and given our long agenda, I will um, just point out that you have a written report in front of you. And I'd also like to thank uh, Mr. Dennis for his service to the commission. He's been very helpful to us uh, and the staff. Yep. Agenda item number three is the legislative update. Update, Ms. Schuyler. Uh, I have nothing to report, and thank you, Mr. Dennis. We shall miss you. Moving right along. Agenda item number four is the consent calendar. We have five items, and they are as follows. Item number 4A is the adaptive reuse of St. Elizabeth Center Building, the Department of Homeland Security. 4B is the Boundary Channel Drive <coughs> Access Control Point Project at the Pentagon. 4C is the installation of three backup power generators power generators at the Department of Agriculture. 4D is the Benjamin Murch Elementary School Expansion Project. And 4E is the Declaration of Covenant for Closing of Public Streets and res Reservations 243 and 244. Are there any questions on any item on the consent calendar? Hearing none, is there a motion on the consent calendar? So moved. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor of the consent calendar as presented say aye. Aye. Uh, opposed no. What would it be without you? Uh, you got to get in one more. <laughs> Agenda item number 5A is a request to transmit a proposed amendment to the Pennsylvania Avenue Development Corporation plan um, at square 378 and 379. And we have Ms. Miller. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. And members of the Commission. NCPC is initiating an amendment to the 1974 Pennsylvania Avenue Plan for squares 378 and 379 in accordance with the 1996 Memorandum of Agreement between GSA, the Park Service, and NCPC. We briefed the Commission back in September on the Pennsylvania Avenue Plan to set the stage for today's presentation because this area is governed by a unique set of regulations and review process. Staff is proposing to amend the 1974 plan to allow for the potential redevelopment and reuse of squares 378 and 379 for the property that's currently occupied. Oh, I'm sorry, something just moved on the screen behind me. For the currently uh, for the property that's currently occupied by the J. Edgar Hoover Building, located at the 900 block of Pennsylvania Avenue. GSA is proposing a transaction that will potentially relocate the FBI headquarters and transfer title of this property to allow for private development. The plan amendment is the first step of a two-step process to update the plan to allow this, this redevelopment to occur. These squares are located at the center of the avenue uh, between the White House and Congress. This is a 21 block area within the Pennsylvania Avenue plan. As you may remember that this is an area that the Pennsylvania Avenue Development Corporation, which I'll refer to as the PADC, um, prepared this 1974 plan for all privately owned land. Uh, and it was a redevelopment plan for a, a cohesive redevelopment plan for this 21 block area between, White House, between the White House and Congress. The 1974 plan is the foundational document for the redevelopment of this area, and that is the plan that we're proposing to amend. Another important tool are the square guidelines, and the square guidelines are really provide more specific guidance. They're similar to a zoning code, 
and that they address more specific information like the use mix, circulation, loading areas. They also will, they also will cover the dimensional um, quantitative uh, setbacks, upper story setbacks, building lines, uh, as well as the building and site aesthetics. We will be back before you sometime later in 2016 with the proposed square guidelines. Okay. So this is actually an excerpt from the 1974 plan for squares 378 and 379. And the plan includes the goals for this redevelopment area. But it also includes the development principles and the guidelines for redevelopment, as I said, for the privately owned land. And, for, and because the FBI site is, is federally owned, the only thing it really talks about is it being for the FBI use. So that's, really, that's why we're here before you today, is that we need to amend the plan to allow it to develop for private development, or for potentially to allow it to, to develop privately. You can find the existing text for the uh, for this site on page six of your EDR. So in order to amend this, we need to do two things. We're going to update the existing conditions text, which you will find on the new text is on page seven of the EDR. And we're also going to establish new general development principles for this site, which are on page eight. And I'll go over that in just a second. And in order to prepare this plan amendment, over the summer, NCPC worked with a number of our federal and local stakeholders, uh, the General Services Administration, the Park Service, the Commission of Fine Arts, the District, the District, excuse me, the District of Columbia. And we also worked with a number of stakeholders who are interested in the planning, preservation, and development of Washington, such as the Committee of 100, National Coalition to Save the Mall, and the uh, local advisory, uh, neighborhood advisory neighborhood commissions in the Penn Neighborhood Quarter, I don't know, what's, I'm saying everything backwards today, the Penn Quarter Neighborhood Association. So if you refer to page 7, I'm not going to go actually and read the language, but this is the new text, the new existing conditions text, and it will, what it talks about is what exists at the site today, which is the build, talks about the building use, the size, the age, the architectural style, the setbacks, the upper story setbacks. It mentions that the former D Street was closed and talks about the current, the courtyard, the mezzanine, the security elements, and the streetscape. And if you turn to page eight, this text talks about the new development principles. And there's essentially four. And I'll just briefly talk about, hi highlight some of the key points. The first principle is the use mix. This talks about the combination and integration of residential, commercial, and cultural uses. So should this site redevelop, we would like to see it redevelop to accommodate high density development with a mix of uses. If for some reason it continues for federal use, we would like to see an increase in ground floor active uses in order to see all four sides of the site uh, increase that street activity, to see an increase in street activity. The second principle really deals with massing, which, is the, which talks about the general shape and size of the potential development. And this language talks about complementing, enhancing, enhancing all the surrounding downtown blocks, reinforcing the importance of the avenue as a ceremonial and a lively downtown corridor, as well as articulating a distinctive high quality urban design and architecture, which is befitting to the location. And one of the things that was important to all the stakeholders when we talk about this is we're and concerned about how the, the building fits into the context of Pennsylvania Avenue, but also how it relates to 9th, 9th Street, 10th Street, um, and E Street. The third principle deals with circulation and views. So the circulation patterns and views are established by the rights of way and open spaces, which should respect the LaFont plan by restoring views and circulation patterns, providing for and contributing to the avenue's distinguished character, and of course strengthening the vista to the U.S. Capitol. And the fourth principle addresses the public realm, which includes the publicly owned streets, parks, and accessible open spaces. And this talks about the development's design and ground floor uses should accommodate daily activities. So we want to see an increase in daily active uses um, around all four sides of this, of this property 
And we want to also see an, in, an increase in commerce and public use as well as national and local events. Because there is a very unique um, development review process here, I would like to just summarize that uh, before I conclude with our recommendation. So in accordance with Section 5 of the MOA, upon Commission approval, NCPC will transmit this amendment to GSA and the Park Service for her 45-day consideration. Upon acceptance by GSA and NPS, GSA will transmit the amendment to, a congr to congressional committees for 60 legislative, legislative days, for it's a 60-day 60, 60 review period, and those are legislative days. If the congressional committees do not disapprove the plan amendment within that 60-day period, GSA will notify NCPC and the Park Service that the plan amendment is approved. Once we receive that notification, NCPC staff will then begin engaging local and federal stakeholders as well as the general public in developing the SQUARE guidelines for SQUARES 378 and 379. So therefore, it's the Executive Director's recommendation that the Commission accept the plan amendment to the 1974 Pennsylvania Avenue Plan in accordance with Public Law 104-134, which was updated in 2002 via Public Law 107-217, and transmit the amendment to GSA and the Park Service under Section 5 of the 1996 MOA. That concludes my presentation, and I'd be happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you, Ms. Miller. It's an important item. Um, are there questions or comments from Commission members? It's Hearing none. Um, all in favor of the EDR as presented, say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Oh, we've got to move it. Motion. Oh. Don't move. <laughs> it's been moved and seconded. Um, thank you. All in favor of the EDR, um, all in favor of the motion on the EDR as presented, say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. It's approved. Thank you very much. <laughs> one, or, one or two abstentions? <laughs> two abstentions. Thank you, Ms. Moore. Agenda item number 5B is the final site plans for the Intelligence Community Campus Bethesda Master Site Development. We have Ms. Lee. <laughs> I will note that we have four um, signed up to deliver public comments as well. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the Commission. The United States Army Corps of Engineers, on behalf of the Defense Intelligence Agency, has submitted final site development plans for the ICCB master site development. As you may recall, the ICCB is located on Sangamo Road in Bethesda, Maryland, on a 30-acre campus, located approximately three-quarters of a mile from the district line about a quarter mile east of the Potomac River, and the site sits about 150 vertical feet above the river. Here is an image looking west. The entire western boundary of the site between the site and the river is a steep forested land owned by the National Park Service. And here you can see sections of the George Washington Memorial Parkway, MacArthur Boulevard, the Clara Barton Parkway, and the CNO Canal National Historic Park. To the north of the site is the Waldorf School and a local park. To the east, there is a shopping center. To the south, there is a new town home development under construction, and beyond the immediate surroundings of the site, there is residential neighborhoods. The site has been a federal facility since 1945, when it served as the headquarters of the Army Map Service the primary buildings of the site include Erskine Hall, Robert Hall, Mori Hall, and Neighbor Hall. The site was vacated by its previous tenant, the National Geospatial Agency, and the Office of the Director of National Intelligence is the current <coughs> owner and has, be, has been in the process of redeveloping the site as the new intelligence community campus. The campus vision is to transform an outdated federal facility into a sustainable modern complex that meets the mission and education needs of the intelligence community. The campus will include up to 850,000 square feet of secure office space 
and significant site improvements that will replace seven acres of impervious cover with landscape. Moving into the review process, NCPC approved a master plan in February 2012. And this master plan separated the redevelopment of the site into two phases, north and south. Since 2012, the Commission has been reviewing different buildings included in the master plan. Last summer, the Commission approved the preliminary site development plans for the final phase of the project that ties together previous redevelopment efforts into a landscape and stormwater design for the campus, which brings us to today's final review. The master site design limits of disturbance covers the area highlighted in red, pulling together previous campus improvements into an integrated landscape, site security, and stormwater management plan. The next series of slides show us a progression of the site and how we got here today. In 2008, the campus included over 1,500 surface parking spaces and a total of 19 acres of impervious surface, or 67% of the site. As you can see, the main open space in the campus consisted of a historic landscape. When you compare this 2008 condition to the final plan, you will see how the project has moved in a positive direction, including green spaces in place of impervious areas. Here is an image from 2012 showing the parking facility under construction. And here is a recent aerial photo showing existing conditions. The North Campus was completed in spring 2014. This, the, Centrum building, sorry, the Centrum building was recently completed in October 2015 and Erskine and Robert O'Hold will be completed in 2016. Staff analysis has been organized into several sections that are outlined in this slide. First, I will give a brief overview of the final plan Second, I will focus on the design modifications that have been made since the Commission's preliminary review and how the applicant has responded to the Commission's comments. Here you can see the list of comments that the Commission provided during preliminary review. The comments are organized into two categories, landscape and stormwater management. With regard to landscape, comments include specimen tree protection, perimeter fence treatment, sorry, shade, irrigation, porous material installation, screening, and light spill. Regarding stormwater management, I will address compliance with state and federal regulations, as well as NCPC requirements. Lastly, I will talk about the modifications to the stormwater management plan that have been taking place as a result of additional coordination with MDE. The site plan has not changed significantly since preliminary review. However, it addresses outstanding landscape and stormwater management issues. Here is the preliminary site approved by the Commission last July. And here is the final site plan that retains the elements seen in previous design, including the overall landscape. In addition to pavement removal, the project includes environmental site design strategies to improve stormwater management quality, such as bioretention areas, grass swells, and an underground storage facility. Now I'm going to focus on the changes that have been made since the Commission approved the preliminary plans. Concerning the landscape, the Commission expressed concerns about specimen tree protection. In an effort to protect specimen trees, the applicant indicated that a certified arborist visited the site and provided recommendations on specific tree protection measures, primary modifications to protect and reduce impacts to existing specimen trees are highlighted in red, and the final plan relocates the existing pedestrian entry that was located here, adjacent to the ellipse to the north, shifts the gate along the fence line in this area, and includes recommendations in the design specifications to avoid da damage to specimen trees during construction. In terms of fence perimeter, in, in terms of perimeter fence treatment, the Commission recommended to minimize vegetation clearing along the perimeter double fence along the west and south 
of the campus and eliminate the proposed river rock along the required 10 feet clear area and consider an alternative treatment for this sensitive slope area. Since preliminary review, the final plan includes a mulch layer to provide low maintenance pervious ground cover along the back of Erskine Hall in this area and minimizes vegetation clearing along the perimeter double fence. Regarding shade, the Commission recommended to ensure adequate shade along the pedestrian walkway that connects the parking garage with the centrum and, the, um, and uh, by providing additional trees. Since the Commission's preliminary approval, the applicant planted additional trees along the walking paths in the area highlighted in red. The Commission also made general comments about minimizing irrigation and recommended the applicant to install porous concrete along the walkways. The final plan includes porous pavement along the fire access lane in front of Roberto Hall and also the grass paper utility corridor in front of the electrical substation and walkways include porous base stone to promote site drainage. Regarding irrigation, no new irrigation systems are planned consistent with LEED standards. Irrigation has been limited to temporary watering required to establish vegetation and water efficient plants have been selected. The only area that requires irrigation is the historic ellipse. As part of the section 106 process, the applicant is required to maintain the ellipse integrity of setting. Regarding screening, the Commission recommended to consider additional landscape to screen views and minimize light spill around the garage and vehicle inspe inspection, which is here, to address community concerns. As you can see in this graphic, the current landscape design suggests planting areas you can see here on the west side and around the garage and on the north side to address screening concerns outside the secure fence along the west and north of the campus. You can see that the proposed trees on the west are within the campus side boundary, which are here and here. And, and the, while the trees along the north are outside the campus on Montgomery County land, as you can see here. The applicant acknowledges that the transition along the north boundary will require Order coordination, approval, and permitting from the Montgomery County Department of Parks. The intent of this graphic is to illustrate and confirm the applicant's commitments to review these areas for increased screening. The specific location and planting details have not been identified yet and will be decided collectively with the community. In order to develop a screening solution, the applicant plans to conduct an evening walk to observe the campus from specific points of concern with the community and landscape architect. The goal is to collectively evaluate light spill and screening needs outside the fence during the winter months and discuss screening solutions. The team plans to identify strategic locations for additional trees and come up with a joint design solution. The construction of new townhouses on the site's southern boundary, which you can see here, resulted in significant tree removal of the adjacent property. The final ICCB landscape plan includes trees along the south perimeter, as you can see here, and the applicant has committed to working with the community to evaluate the need for additional screening in this area of the campus during the upcoming community sidewalk. As you may recall, the bioretention areas consist of low-growing plants with a 6-inch height restriction and scattered trees. The final plan combines smaller bioretention clusters into two larger areas within the same general footprint. When you compare the bioretention section from the preliminary submission, you can see highlighted in red here, with the latest design, you can see that there are no significant impacts to the landscape. With respect to stormwater management, the project must meet federal stormwater requirements under Section 438 of the Energy Independence and Security Act and the Maryland Department of the Environment Stormwater Guidelines. MDE issued a stormwater concept approval on October 15, 2015, and is currently review reviewing the site development plans, and we do not foresee any major above-grade changes to the plan 
to the final plan given MDE's concept approval. Since NCPC preliminary approval, there are no significant changes to the stormwater management plan or impacts to the landscape. The stormwater management plan has improved as a result of the continuous dialogue with MDE during concept approval. I will talk about those refinements in a moment. As a way of background, MDE approval process includes three stages, concept, site development, and final. And as I mentioned, MDE has issued concept approval and is currently reviewing preliminary plans. Also, the project meets NCPC's requirements for stormwater management plan, and the applicant has provided documentation addressing compliance with local and federal stormwater management standards. If you compare these two images, you can see that there has been progress in the campus. Seven acres of impervious surface will, will be replaced with landscape, improving the campus environmental performance and visual presence in the community. For the rest of the stormwater management section, I will highlight the changes since preliminary approval, which have resulted from coordination with MDE. These modifications increase the ESA and MDE volume compliance for the entire campus. As you can see highlighted in blue, the bioretention areas are larger. The final design includes two consolidated bioretention areas to retain and treat stormwater runoff. The storage volume of the <coughs> underground infiltration facility, which is here, has been expanded while providing a smaller footprint. The plan includes soil amendments to increase infiltration capabilities. And lastly, the stormwater management plan, in currently under, under review by MDE, includes two additional features to address community concerns about potential flooding on Brooks Lane during large storm events. These features are not required by regulatory standards. These include grass swells and side grading along Brooks Lane to filter and treat stormwater, and a high flow bypass, which is an underground system that directs flows that exceed capacity from the Brooks Lane storm drain during storm events that exceed the 25 year storm. This system is under consideration for feasibility. We want to acknowledge a separate but related project on NPS adjacent land, which is highlighted in yellow to the west of the site. As part of the permit process, MDE has required DIA to investigate, design, and construct repairs to downstream channels on adjacent NPS land. As a first step towards fulfilling the MDE condition, the applicant completed an outfall channel study in 2013 to establish the impacts of off-site stormwater runoff erosion. As a second step, DIA and NPS executed a memorandum of intent to define the working relationship between the two agencies. During preliminary review, the Commission encouraged the applicant to further coordinate with MDE, NPS, and the community to address off-site stormwater runoff erosion caused during previous occupancy of the site. The applicant has continued coordination with NPS. The 15% concept design is expected to be completed in 2016. Then NPS will start the NEPA process which will take 12 to 18 months, and the community will participate during the NEPA process. We know that the outfall remediation is a separate project which is not before the Commission today. With respect to community coordination, since the preliminary approval last summer, the applicant has continued to engage with the community and has held a series of community outreach opportunities, including document availability sessions, community meetings, the ribbon coding ceremony, and perimeter sidewalks. As I mentioned earlier, there will be a community walk scheduled for December 10th to focus on strategic screening and light spill solutions. Staff finds that with regard to the comprehensive plan, the project is consistent with the federal workplace, environment, and transportation elements. And lastly, the project is consistent with the NCPC approved master plan. A last coordination note, during preliminary review, the commission also requested responses to comments provided by, Mary, by Montgomery County. The applicant's responses are included in the submission package. <coughs> to conclude, 
the executive director's recommendation is for the commission to approve the final site development plans for the ICCB master site design and notes that the applicant has modified the design to respond to the commission's previous comments and notes that the applicant has committed to continue to evaluate the site's vegetation and landscape, including those areas located outside the fence on the north and west sides, as well as the south end of the site. The applicant will develop a landscape maintenance for the site, and any substantial changes are required to be submitted to the Commission. And finally, encourage the applicant to continue to work with federal and state agencies and the community to address off-site stormwater runoff erosion. With this, I conclude my presentation, and I'm available for questions the Commission may have. Also, the ICCB team is here to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Lee, very much. Um, before we discuss it among ourselves, we have <clears throat> four uh, members of the public who have signed up to speak. Uh, each represents an organization, so you'll have five minutes. And I would say, given the size of our docket, I'm going to stick rigidly to the five minutes. So we have your presentations if you submitted them to us. We have your written comments if you submitted them to us, and they'll be part of the record. So I encourage you to keep an eye on the clock, and as it winds down to five minutes, adjust your presentation and comments accordingly. Um, first, we have Mr. Berg, followed by Dr. Zeisel, and then third will be Mr. Barrett, and then last, Mr. Northrop. Berg, Zeisel, Barrett, Northrop. Mr. Berg, welcome. Uh, Mr. Chairman, may I ask that we change the order? Sure. Mr. Barrett goes first, uh, Mr. Northrop goes third, I go, I'm sorry, Mr. Northrop goes second, I go third, and Mr. Zeisel goes last? It's fine, just come on. <laughs> I'm sorry, identify yourself for the record. Uh, my name is Thomas Barrett. I'm representing the Glen Echo Heights Citizens Association. Perfect. Thank you very much. Welcome. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Thomas F. Barrett. I am here today speaking on behalf of Glen Echo Heights, and I'm a local resident of 60 years in the neighborhood. To paraphrase my co-rep, Rachel Toker, at the July hearing, if you don't do anything, the 2012 environmental commitments will be disregarded, in whole or in part, as the development nears design completion. And here we are today. Four months later, I can report the failure to engage substantively with the Stormwater Committee. For example, in the Waldorf briefing slides, which you have, mi misrepresent many of DIA's commitments to the community and the stratus of progress. Today, I want to note that the Corps did not even submit these commitment letters to you as part of this hearing, despite the promise in point one of the January 2012 letter to do exactly that. This commitment said the executive agent on behalf of the Director of National Intelligence will direct the Corps to implement the design changes listed below, and this letter will be attached to the Site Master Plan, the Site Development Guide, as well as planning documents for Phase 1 and 2 that are submitted to the Commission for review. The committees have been cooperative in its efforts to help DIA get it right in this once-in-a-century opportunity to redevelop the site while protecting this precious Potomac River Vista and water source on which the intelligence campus will reside. Uh, kudos to Jen Mahoney for agreeing to stand up and take ownership of the issues we hope all parties wish to address successfully. Our attempts to address the key issues affecting the property in over five years have been to no avail. Why does the director and the Corps refuse to codify these points into the master plan? Of course, why would the Commission even know as the written commitments are not even included in the submission you have before you today? We and the Commission are now at the 11th hour on our community's ability to have any input on this. This inconsistency leaves us all wondering which, if any, commitments they will implement. In the case of the document before you today, there are several inconsistencies and omissions that lend credence to our concerns. For example, the stormwater plan on the site uh, addresses 11 acres but the property site covers over 30. The master site design covers 25 acres, not the full 30 acres. There is no comprehensive stormwater management plan in existence for the entire property. And there is no formal plan for restoration of 75 years of neglect accumulated on the outer perimeter of the property and on the properties leading down to the Potomac River. So where are we now? But positive steps have taken place to infiltration on the south campus, potentially to eliminate flooding on the lanes, the upcoming walk around could be a first step after nearly three years towards planting. However, on the restoration of damage, the site design defers to the Park Service 
ignoring extensive damage on the site itself in all three watersheds on its western side. The site design offers no mention of restoration anywhere on the property, only on park service land. Contrary to reps in the uh, executive recommendation and submission, the park service has stated it is not undertaking the study and or proposal of restoration uh, measures on the property, outside the fence line, or on any other properties downhill of the campus. None. These points are contrary to the commitments to what we've been told over the past two years and as late as two days ago. We received from the director in 2012 written commitments to address restoration and management of the entire damaged area. Why is there no plan in the master site design to support these commitments? Because the campus of Bethesda is hoping to disregard these commitments in fact while espousing them in public. Absent a deferral of approval, we hope the commission will at the very least request the director and the Corps to amend the master site design. Please take a look under the hood of this defective plan submission and support our request that your action statement encourage the agency to work more closely with the community reps to resolve these environmental concerns consistent with the director's commitments and to foster the trust that government will keep its word. It's your last opportunity to take this step of asking the project team to work cooperatively with the community and to fulfill the commitments on tree planting, restoration, and stormwater management of the entire site by making them a permanent part of the master site design. Uh, thank you for your considered effort in this manner. And good to see Mr. Dennis, my former emeritus. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Barrett, very much. Then who is next? My name is Brad Northrup. I am a representative of the Brookmont Civic League, a local association, as well as a member of the Stormwater Committee. I'll be addressing our concerns related to the landscaping and screening plans in the current proposal for the site. From the beginning of this project, community representatives have worked with the site project team and its commission and this commission to ensure that the ICCB site is integrated into the surrounding natural landscape and that its visual impact on residents and travelers along the adjacent roads is minimized and that these actions are consistent with the commitments made by the site management to the community. Throughout our meetings and written communications, we have made clear what actions we believe are essential to these commitments. First, the tree should be planted on relative sight lines to the <coughs> northwest and south of the site and that the plantings will not be done in a one and done exercise, but include additional rounds of planning as needed. Second, that the lands a landscape management maintenance plan, excuse me, may be developed and implemented to provide for watering and otherwise maintaining the health of the new and existing trees and vines until they become established. This should include the removal of invasive vines and vegetation that pose a threat to their health and specifically include er areas outside the fence line of the site. Third, that action be taken to resolve the issues with light pollution affecting neighbor neighboring properties from the perimeter lights on the parking garage as well as the lights within the garage to minimize light spill and to screen views to the garage visitor screening station and other relevant buildings. Over the past last three years, despite numerous meetings from three or four walk-arounds with site staff aimed at reaching mutual agreement on planning and screening types, locations, and maintenance, and despite the specific executive director's recommendation from previous NCP hearings to take actions, to, to hearings, the actions have taken have not come close to providing adequate screening at the site and a time period that is reasonable and consistent with the com commitments made to the community. To recap the current status, in the last three years, only 60 trees have been planted under the original contract, 49 in 2013, 11 in 2015. Over half the 80 trees were either planted outside the relevant sight lines or are now dead. As we, far as we know, there's no budget currently existing to, and no funds have been obligated for additional plantings and maintenance. Although the current executive director's recommendation does include, as we saw, a final landscape design concept and references increased tree planting in key areas inside and outside the fence line, there are flaws in this concept 
design and it's questionable that is an accurate representation <coughs> of the community's objective. For instance, they mentioned the county plan, the planning on county land on the north side of the community where we've been told by the county planning commission that that is probably not feasible. Although good progress was made in the planning of the green screen on the parking garage in 2013 and 2014, we remain concerned about their maintenance and the growth of the screen to keep up with the expanding occupation of the garage. In addition, new bright perimeter lights installed in 2015 are directed outward with the visibility and intensity inconsistent with community commitments. And there is still some bright light, garage lighting that is obtrusive for local park users, neighboring communities, and travelers on the adjacent streets. Most importantly, to date, the community has no, received no specific written plan as to how and when this design concept will be implemented and if it will meet the objectives of the commitments to the community. Recently, we also want to acknowledge the good work of Jen uh, Mahoney in approving the relationship uh, between the community, community and the site management, and we'll also acknowledge Mr. Manselman's intervention in that regard. We've had a chance to brief Ms. Mahoney on our ongoing issues of landscaping and screening at the site, and she has been responsive to our concerns. But at this point, site leadership is still in the process of identifying what specific actions will be taken and when. As was noted, there's going to be a scheduled December 10th walk around and it will involve community representatives <coughs> and the project landscaping expert. We are hopeful that this will finally lead to a plan and implementation of landscaping and screening actions we have suggested, but I think you can understand that based on past history, we still retain some skepticism. We will come to this hearing on, uh, on the final approval of the ICCB site development plan in a position where there has been no, there's been low, so little progress on this issue for so long, and most of what is needed to meet the commitments in the com to the community is yet to be determined. So today we are, have a relatively modest request that the commission include in, as an additional condition statement in your final approval to provide greater clarity and incentive for site management to fulfill its landscaping, light suppression, and restoration commitments to the community. Our suggested statement is as follows. <coughs> NCPC encourages the applicant to work with the community to expedite the development and implementation of, lands of a landscaping plan that resolves issues with light pollution, specifies the location of new trees and vines needed to screen the garage, and other campus buildings from the north, west, and south sight lines, and specifies how the health of the new and existing plants will be maintained. Further, we encourage the applicant to restart tree planting on site no later than the spring of 2016 and continue as needed until the re relevant commitments are met. I thank you, and we look forward to continuing our collaboration with the site team to resolve Thank, these thank you, Mr. Northrup, very much. Uh, is Dr. Zeisel next or Mr. Berg? Mr. Berg. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the commission. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to offer comments on behalf of the Community Stormwater Committee, which represents nine participating communities on our environmental concerns with the project. My focus today is on restoration of damage caused by, by stormwater. Are my slides up? Uh, they were going to be up? We've got them before us here. Oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, so from the beginning, the community representatives have tried to work with the project team, NPS, MDE, and this commission to ensure that damage to the site and downstream properties, including the CNO canal caused by the site's stormwater discharges, is restored. CSC continues to fulfill this function. Despite our efforts, the restoration process is seriously behind schedule. Restoration plans for the site itself are inadequate. Restoration plans for non-ICCB lands are not being coordinated and DIA's commitment to the community to restore the damage has been undermined by faulty progress process. The MSD <coughs> perpetuates this problem because it fails to address the entire site. By omitting the five to six acres outside the, fit, the fence where stormwater damaged the site in three locations. The MSD is incomplete and not ready for final approval. Starting with the critical failure to address damage in the perimeter areas of the site, the EDR and the MSD submission misstate the nature of the damage and deflect responsibility from DIA to NPS. 
with the result that the community's input will be deferred until restoration plans are fully developed and resources for study of the damage have been expended. The restoration process is not working and the results will be incomplete. Even your slide 34 inaccurately showed that the damage stops at MacArthur Boulevard instead of going all the way to the river. At this point, I'd like to acknowledge that the executive agent for the ICCB project, Mr. Manselman, offered in mid-August to work with CSE to explore the community's restoration and other concerns. Despite his and Jen Mahoney's intervention and good intentions, however, since mid-August, scant progress has been made on restoration. Um, on the third slide, NCPC staff indicated to us that restoration is not a central NCPC consideration. Yet this is a redevelopment project with legacy issues, not a Greenfields project. The scars on the site and on properties downhill of the site, including a national treasure, the NPS managed CNO Canal, are legacies of decades of stormwater practices on the site. If NCPC, like the MSD, inadequately considers the stormwater damage and approves the MSD as, as submitted, it will fail in its planning mission. On slide four, I've quoted the planning missions. We ask that to make your review comprehensive and systematic, you pause to consider the adequacy of restoration plans. The county park, the CNO Canal, and other areas damaged by the site stormwater are where we live and play, we are uh, affected. Please do not abdicate your role. Our major concern is captured by the inadequate description of restoration plans contained in both the submission and the EDR, shown on slide five which proposes to encourage the applicant to address historical off-site stormwater <coughs> erosion and sedimentation damage caused by during the previous occupancy of the site. This statement misrepresents the problem. A few specifics are shown on slide six. One, the damage is not limited to off-site locations. Damage begins on the site at three outfalls, crosses the site at each location, and only then impacts other properties. Two, the damage is ongoing in all three damaged areas. It is not limited to historical problems to illustrate stormwater felled another tree this summer. Three, the damage is not limited to erosion and sedimentation. There are also fallen trees, invasive plants, mats of vines, and more. Four, the current effort to scope out restoration uh, needs exclude some of the damaged areas, even on NPS property. Five, the current process for restoration decision-making lacks a coordinating institution. Six, the process shuts out the community until it's too late, after all restoration studies are complete. But the communities, unlike the agencies, are directly affected. You should know that MDE has conditioned final stormwater permit approval on a concrete restoration plan, but the EDR makes no mention of this fact. On slide seven, in bullet two, the EDR recommendation language is incomplete and far too weak in light of these inaccuracies in the submission which carry through to the EDR. Uh, and, and the slide seven shows the language that's proposed for you to approve. In light of NCPC's environmental protection mission and the serious deficiencies in restoration efforts to date, including process deficiencies, we ask that you strengthen this recommendation to read, NCPC encourages the applicant to work with interested and affected federal and state agencies and communities to restore the areas damaged by the site stormwater on-site and off-site. Uh, thank you for considering this request. Thank you, Mr. Berg, very much. And then last, we have Dr. Zeisel. Thank you. My name is Arthur Zeisel, uh, representing the Sumner Citizens Association and also a member of the uh, Community Stormwater Committee. Uh, I'm honored to be here, of course. but. Uh, one of the um, problems with the uh, effort to date has been the coordination with the local communities. And I'll touch on that in general. But I'd like to tell you that I have myself personally in my federal career uh, managed large projects uh, that involve the affected uh, communities and affected people, the stakeholders at the federal, state, local, and private sector. And I have a pretty good understanding of what uh, that relationship should be and how important it is to talk to the stakeholders. That has not been happening very well on this project. Uh, I do want to mention to you that you're being asked to approve a plan that has really uh, contains a major stormwater management component, a landscaping component, and you heard from my colleagues, and we know 
that the Maryland Department of Environment, the review regulatory agency, will be rejecting the uh, preliminary plan that has been submitted to them recently. Uh, and also that, uh, that they had not been, uh, we, we sent to them a very long statement uh, with our concerns of the plan, and we did recommend that they not accept the, the preliminary plan. Uh, the preliminary plan that they have in front of us now is based on a concept plan. But let me just read you one sentence from that concept plan approval by the state. It says, the should soil, soils investigation within the proposed management area produce results incompatible with the concept design, a new concept, a new concept plan will be required. Changing the fundamental elements of the concept plan will also necessitate a new concept approval. That tells me and should tell you that the basic concept for this plan is still subject to review and further investigation. So it may, everything may be changing very much in the future. Uh, the community commitments uh, are very important to this and one of our biggest concerns as expressed before is that it has not been made a part of the official review record, even though it was promised to be done so by the executive agent for the, uh, the site. And to, that was negotiated over years and really represented what we, our understanding was with what the federal government would do in this case. And we suggest that performance, at least in terms of community interests, be reviewed against those community commitment letters. Uh, your last meeting in uh, July uh, recommended, or not recommended, but encouraged the site team, the applicant, to work more closely with communities. Well, uh, that's not, had not taken place. If anything, we've been stonewalled for the last five months. We had, we prepared very detailed comments reviewing the 35% plan, and we, to this day, have not received anything back from the applicant. And so basically, we feel that they are ignoring uh, our, our input. Uh, we are hoping that uh, things will improve. Uh, Jen Mahoney has got a great background in engineering and management and has really promised to work more closely with us and we think there is hope for the future. But again, where I think we are on this project is you're being asked to approve a plan which has not yet been even accepted by the Maryland Department of Environment, that there are major problems in the landscaping and in the stormwater management, and most importantly, in the effects and the implications on, on, on the communities. How can you approve a plan that has those major elements missing or unapproved? Uh, I don't understand. But I think the appellant really does want and actually needs, not, they want your approval, and they really need your guidance and advice on how to improve the planning process. I think that's an area where this project is, is falling down, to tell you the truth. Uh, it has to be improved because many of the technical aspects will be dealt with by the Maryland Department of Environment, and we respect the judgment of your staff to defer to the Maryland State Department of Environment for most of the technical aspects of water management. However, you have the expertise in intergovernmental relations and in planning and management that the project desperately needs. So our ask of you, if you will, is that you not leave the project, that you continue to somehow stay involved with the project and make sure as we move into the very critical restoration planning for damage, repair, and prevention of future losses, that the intergovernmental and planning relationships uh, are adequate and so forth. So, Please stay involved. You hopefully will stay. You know, you can figure out the best way you can do that. But we, we need you and we want you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zeisel, very much. Uh, we will return the matter to the commission. Uh, at this point, public hearing is over. Um, commission members have questions or comments or questions for Ms. Lee for clarification. Just one item, Ms. Lee. The um, on the stormwater management the. Maryland has granted concept approval, and they meet all of the applicant's stormwater plan meets all of our MCPC's stormwater requirements. Is that correct? Yes. So for final, we require a stormwater management plan for projects that are above 5,000 square feet of land disturbance, and we provide we require 
um, a narrative explaining how they comply with ESA and MDE and they have provided sufficient documentation. Thank you very much. Other questions? Mr. May? I'm just wondering if um, DIA wants to, or if there's a rep who wants to address any of the comments that were made by the community. <coughs> And specifically, can I ask the question whether and get some clarity on what the what the position of MDE is? Because we're hearing both things: they're going to approve or they're not going to approve the report or the plan. I I, I think I, I would like to answer that question as a technical engineer of record, uh, ma'am. Identify yourself. Excuse me, I'm Tom Fitzgerald with Wiley Wilson. We're the engineers that are preparing the master plan. We were before the uh, board here in July, and I appreciate your time today. Um, the process is we submitted in October 30th for the final site development. You speak up a little bit, Mr. Fitzgerald. For the final site development permit application <laughs> to NDE on October 30th of this year. And that was right after we, about a month after we got the concept approval from MDE. So now that 400 page document has been with MDE since that time for them to review. Obviously, that's a voluminous set of calculations. We have not gotten any comments back from MDE officially at this point. That's a normal course of action. We will get comments on that submittal. We will make changes to that submittal. Generally, it's the technical changes that are required to meet MDE's review. And then that gets incorporated in the final permit submittal. So. It's not rejected by MDE at this point. It's the ongoing dialogue of permitting that occurs over time. Thank you. Additional comments you'd like to make on, on anything you've heard today? Uh, good afternoon. I'm Jennifer Mahoney. Uh, and on behalf of the Office of Director of National Intelligence, which is where I work, and also the campus owner, uh, thank you for your time. Uh, having assumed the roles and responsibilities from Jim Manselman back in September of, of, in October, uh, Jim has since moved on to uh, another uh, position outside of uh, this program. Uh, I've continued to meet with the community, uh, as you've heard today, uh, and we've had a lot of meetings, a lot of great discussions, uh, a lot of uh, information uh, we've put in, just for simplicity, I, I've put into what I call four buckets. Uh, we have the landscaping and the screening, uh, a lot of discussion about that. This December 10th walkthrough is going to be key for that. Uh, we need to identify what additional trees, what additional measures need to be taken. ODNI is prepared to plant the additional trees. We're prepared to do the maintenance. We are in the process of transitioning the campus to operations and maintenance. We move our first tenants into the Centrum building, actually starting tomorrow, which is a great success story for the team. Uh, but with operations and maintenance also comes the landscape responsibility. So we are putting in place a plan to take care of the invasive species, the trees when we do plant them. Our goal is to plant them this spring. Uh, so again, this, this December 10th walk is, is critical. Just to touch upon some of the lighting, a, a lot of lighting measures have been uh, addressed by the team. Uh, we've installed shields on roof lights. We've installed shielding on exit signs. We've reduced the overall garage lighting capacity down by two thirds. We're meeting minimum safety codes today. Uh, we do have an agreement with the community that we would not turn on the upper deck lights until we start moving the campus in. We're starting to move the campus in, but really the agreement goes more towards moving more people in. We're not going to turn the lights on and we're not going to create more light infiltration until we absolutely need to, and that's when the rest of the campus starts rolling in. But again, the December 10th walkthrough is key to that because we're going to be able to see what some of the community uh, challenges are with that, and we'll try to, to address them the best we can. Uh, our second bucket is stormwater management. I think a lot of success and a lot of great news stories has been made with that. I think the community members did see a lot of the comments they made, although not well communicated. I'm not disagreeing that communication hasn't been its best with this program, but we've committed to improving that. And again, you've heard that today from the four members who stood up, that we're going to improve the communication plan and the correspondence between us and them. But stormwater management with MDE's comments will address what they have to say and we'll tackle that. Third bucket is restoration. We do have some ways to go on restoration. We're dependent on the National Park Service survey. We're working with them. We're working with uh, our other partners, but it, it's, a, it's a road we gotta continue to go down together. 
And I, I say that because my last bucket is communication and correspondence. I've agreed to monthly meetings with the community. I've agreed to monthly updates to the community where we will talk to each of these subjects as detailed as we need to be. We'll address the whole community through town halls. We'll address the situation we had at the last town hall, although unfortunate that the teams, the community, and the program team disagreed with the slides. We will tackle the slides together before we even put ourselves in that situation again. Correspondence is key, communication is key, and we're gonna work hard to do that, at least through the next year and then and beyond. We'll keep the community abreast on what contracts are awarded and our budgets going forward and how much is being planted and how much is being dressed as we roll around the master site and award these contracts. I'm gonna give Tom the opportunity to add some additional comments as needed. Yeah, I think the only other comment I would add to follow up to the off-site channels thing is that we are working closely with the National Park Service. They are the primary landowner downstream of the site, and they are making progress towards that NEPA document, which will, again, open up the door for the community to be engaged during that scoping process for the NEPA work uh, to document what is the best restoration manner for these channels downstream. So uh, they're, the, the owner is fulfilling that responsibility by supporting the, the Park Service in that. Okay. Thank you very much, Tom. Mr. Fisher. Additional questions or comments among commission members? If not, the chair would entertain a motion. Mr. May? Well, I, before we go to the motion, I just I, I do want to recognize the, uh, the hard work of the neighbors of the property and, and what they've done to try to move this project in a much better direction. I mean, I think overall the, the concept that originally came about was uh, always going to be an improvement, but I think that uh, you know, when we started having our discussions with it and the, co the community came out strongly with concerns about a variety of areas, uh, the, the project, I think, uh, took a significant turn for the better. Uh, I think at this point, I don't, I don't think that we are ignoring the concerns that are being raised by the community. It's just that NCPC's role in this at, at is more or less coming to an end with the approval of this plan, and then that from here on out, it's um, it's really with uh, the defense agencies involved in the Park Service and the community to try to, try to realize um, both the completion of the project and then the repair of the damage. I know that we're committed to try to work with the community the best that we can through that process, and uh, we'll be working on our environmental assessment. Uh, it'll be kicking off very soon um, with public scoping, and we'll make sure that we try to address as much uh, as we can in that context. So, thank you. Thank you, Mr. May. That's right? Yeah. Um, it's not working, so that's okay, right? No. It doesn't work. Oh, there we go. Um, I'm very, once again, I'm troubled about the lack of clarity. Can, do we have, um, do we have, can we get confirmation on the MDE um, position? Because we're hearing, once again, we're in the land of the he said, she said, and it's not a comfortable place to be. Um, having said that, if we don't have any clarity, maybe, do, do we or do we not? Yes. Yeah. Um, I mean, so it sounds like it's in process. Ethan, but Ethan Bright from MD is here today that yeah, would, or, is willing to speak to the project are you review an process. Guy? Oh, please, can we talk to you? <laughs> so is it he said or she said? It is a process. They will identify. <laughs> I, 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 I'm sorry, my, I'm Ethan Bright with the uh, Maryland Department of the Environment. Um, it is a, um, an ongoing process. We will get um, plans in where we will review a lot of the technical details, and many of those technical details will need to be revised several times before MDE will give their final approval. Um, there are still several technical details in this process, in this project, that will still need to be revised from the most recent submission. So the statement that you plan to reject this plan is not quite accurate? It could be, depending on your interpretation. <laughs> Your definition of reject. <laughs> oh, <laughs> man. We're not, okay. we're, we're not going to be approving the set of plans. No. Okay. If there needs to be technical corrections, <laughs> right. then I mean, it's like any process. Part. So, in other words, you can't really, per, you can't definitively state that it's going to be rejected. Um, or or accepted. Or, accept or, or re either way. I mean, so, so it isn't, so that, that's not an accurate statement that you know it's going to be rejected. 
in other words, one of the testimonies was that you knew it was going to be rejected. Okay, thank you. That's enough. I understand, I think. Um, so, so I think, that, once again, despite how painful it's been for all of you, I gather, it's still been an exemplar planning process, I have to say. Um, and the, result, the proof is in the pudding. I mean, when you look at the before and after, um, wow, um, the process, as tedious as it is, has worked. Um, I, I have to say, okay, so I'm, I, 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 I think I compared this whole thing to a bad marriage at one point. And, um, that Elizabeth has carried through. So, so as your therapist, um, I, I guess I have to say at some point you just have to have ir irreconcilable differences, but the kids are all right. <laughs> Thank you. And, and so I'd I just like to thank you all for being persistent. I agree with Commissioner May that our, our work is probably done here, but I would encourage you to find another therapist. And please keep talking to each other because it is a handsome, handsome campus. I drove by it the other day and I'm almost sorry to hear that you're already moving in because I was hoping that we could come see it. And once you get in lockdown, I suppose mere mortals can't visit. Okay. So, we'll, we'll, we'll stop but, but, but if you invite people, I'd like to come. We, we will. Thank you. <laughs> we will. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wright. Mr. Chairman, um, I, I do know that uh, the DNI is committed to doing this right. That's why he's got Jen where she's at now, uh, and uh, I'm confident they're going to get there. And having satisfied the requirements that we have for the NCPC, I make a motion to recommend approval of the executive director's recommendation. It's been moved. Is there a second? Second, second? It's been moved and seconded. Sensing no further comment. All in favor of the EDR as written and presented, say aye. Aye. Um, Opposed, no. Thank you very much. Thank you. Item 5C is the approval of comments on the concept design for the National China Garden at the National Arboretum. And again, we have Ms. Lee. States Department of Agriculture has submitted concept plans for the National China Garden at the National Arboretum. The National Arboretum is located on a 446-acre site two miles from the U.S. Capitol Building in Northeast Washington, D.C. It is bordered. It is bordered by Bladensburg Road to the west. New York Avenue to the north and M Street to the south. The proposed site is situated on the eastern area of the Arboretum at the intersection of Holly Spring and Meadow Roads on a 12-acre undeveloped parcel. Hickey Hill and the Anacostia River are located further to the east. Here are images of existing conditions. The site consists of a gently sloping meadow against a backdrop of pine trees, and the stand of pine trees has an opening on the slope that allows views into the city. You can see it here in the plant view. To start, I will provide some background on the project. The vision for the National China Garden builds upon formal agreements between China's State Forestry Administration and the USDA to build a classical Chinese garden in the nation's capital as a gift to the American people from the Re People's Republic of China. The purpose of this project is to create the finest example of a classical Chinese garden in the United States, deepening the understanding of garden culture and symbolizing the friendship between nations. 
The government of China will donate the design, construction, artwork, and furniture, while the U.S. government will provide the site, infrastructure, and maintenance. The design team has been working together since 2003 and includes a collaboration between Chinese classical garden experts and U.S. design professionals to ensure compliance with U.S. codes and permit requirements. The National Arboretum is a premier horticulture, research, education, and museum facility established by Congress in 1927 and opened to the public in 1959. The Arboretum is listed on the National Register of Historic Properties. In 2007, NCPC approved a master plan modification that included a concept design for the Chinese Garden Complex. The current plan is generally consistent with the approved master plan. A classical Chinese garden includes five key elements, rocks, water, scenic views, plants, and artwork, to create a balance between natural and man-made structures. The proposed gardens include representation of three types of classical Chinese gardens, residential gardens surrounded by a wall, lakeside gardens, which includes terraces, corridors, pavilions, and bridges, and forest gardens, which include a single structure located on a hill. Here you can see the different types of gardens represented in the complex. The proposed complex includes two examples of residential gardens, which are highlighted in orange, several examples of lake gardens highlighted in blue, and two examples of forest gardens highlighted in pink. In addition to the garden itself, the complex will include 26 structures arranged around an acre and a half central lake. The proposed structures range in height from 12 to 69 feet and include enclosed and open pavilions, walls, mount and rockeries, open corridors, bridges, landscape elements, and a support building. The proposed garden elements represent a composition of replicas of the most representative classical gardens existing in China. The design team surveyed some of these existing precedents to determine the proportion and number of proposed structures. To give you a sense of the scale, the image to the right shows a precedent of an existing garden, and the image to the left shows the proposed design. You can see that the proposed structures are similar in size to their counterparts in China. The next couple of slides, I will show you some elevations for different pavilions to give you a sense of the architectural style. The garden also includes a 5,800 square feet cultural and educational center. Here you can see the proposed white pagoda, which is 69 feet, and the five pavilion terrace, which is 33 feet in height. These are examples of forest gardens. As the design progresses, it will be helpful to provide additional drawings and renderings to help us understand how the garden relates to the arboretum context. We note that an important principle of the traditional Chinese garden is the formal arrangement of built and natural ele elements and their relationship to one another. As the design develops, it will be important to understand how the garden expresses itself internally and its relationship to the immediate surroundings within the Arboretum and the broader context. As I describe the project in more detail, I will focus on particular topics that reflect the way we analyze the project. I will share our comments based on five subjects, views and lighting, accessibility and circulation, pedestrian amenities, landscape and sustainability, and finally, I will provide general comments on the alternatives. Regarding views and lighting, in this section, you can see that the proposed garden in the forest structures, which are the White Pagoda and the Five Terrace Pavilion, are located on a slope, consistent with traditional Chinese precedents. These structures are the tallest elements in the garden complex and will stand out within the garden. In addition, the proposed walls surrounding the residential gardens along Holy Spring Road may be visible from the road. We recommend further visual study along this corridor. Given the location of the proposed garden adjacent to Hickey Hill Overlook, which you can see on the screen, the design should avoid impacting potential historic view sheds. There is a potential narrow view of Washington, as you can see here, created by a break in the pine tree stand to the west of Hickey Hill Overlook. 
Potential views include the Catholic University campus. Therefore, we offer the following comment. Provide additional simulations indicating views and vistas both to and from the garden in order to better understand the relationship of the garden within the arboretum context and the relationship between the garden and the landscape, the implications of changes to topography and the height of the proposed structures within the garden complex, pedestrian views along Holy Spring Road indicating the wall gardens and other vantage points the visual impacts of height, scale, and topography of the proposed White Pagoda and Five Pavilion Terrace on Washington skyline. The proposal includes a lighting approach to highlight architectural and landscape details consisting with traditional Chinese gardens. Light fixtures will be located at pathway, bridges, landscape, and the exterior of structures. Currently, the Arboretum gates are closed at 5 p.m and the Arboretum is open at night for special events only, including the full moon hike. You can see in the image to the left how the National Capitol columns are lit up during special events. However, there is very limited lighting at the Arboretum. Given the height of the proposed structures, topography, and potential views to Washington, D.C., we recommend to study lighting impacts further, and we offer the following recommendations. Minimize light pollution from the garden complex in the surrounding neighborhoods, Consider the placement, intensity, and programming of lighting as to not detract from the views to important symbols and civic buildings. Moving on to accessibility and circulation, the 2007 master plan included a tram stop at the main entrance of the garden. You can see it here highlighted in red. However, the current concept design did not include a tram stop. Given that the garden will become a unique destination, and attract many visitors, we recommend the applicant to further study circulation patterns within the algorithm context and how people get to the site. Regarding accessibility within the garden, we note that the project goal is to achieve compliance with the American with Disabilities Act. In general, we offer the following recommendations regarding circulation. Identify locations for a tram stop, bus drop-off areas, and bicycle racks. Explore opportunities to improve pedestrian circulation considering hierarchy and scale to provide a sense of orientation around the garden. And analyze the impacts of accessible routes including paths, ramps, and handrails in relationship with the topography and landscape. Now I'm going to discuss pedestrian amenities. As the design moves forward, we recommend that the applicant consider pedestrian amenities to improve the visitor experience and consider providing benches as appropriate along the path to enhance the pedestrian experience, considering shade and views to and from the garden, integrating wayfinding and interpretive signage throughout the garden to express the China Garden's mission and highlight the history and name of the proposed structure. Moving to landscape and sustainability, the applicant provided a plant list analysis produced by the Chinese design team, which indicates that some of the plants are not available in the US. The design team is considering whether the plants could be imported from China. As the design progresses, we offer the following <coughs> comments regarding landscape and sustainability. Identify and protect specimen trees, minimize tree cutting and other vegetation removal, and where the removal is necessary, replace trees to prevent neck tree loss, analyze proposed plant list to avoid introducing invasive species, consider water efficient irrigation systems and water efficient landscaping, to reduce irrigation needs, consider low impact development strategies to manage stormwater and reduce runoff to the Anacostia watershed, and include per permeable paving. And lastly, I'm going to provide general comments on the alternatives. The applicant has provided two alternatives. They're very similar, but provide different locations for service and parking areas, as well as the White Pagoda. The first alternative includes the White Pagoda in the, in, in the existing tree clearing to minimize tree removal, as you can see here, and provides three small parking lots for visitors, staff, and service. The second alternative is move the pagoda out of the clearing, as you can see here, to avoid impacts on potential historic view sheds. In addition, the second alternative includes a half acre overflow parking area in this location and relocates the service building to the northwest and consolidates parking. We provide the, the following general comments regarding the alternatives. 
provide a vegetated buffer to screen the maintenance building along Holly Spring Road, pending the visual study of view sheds noted above, examine alternative locations for the white pagoda, consolidate parking as feasible to provide a more efficient layout and limit land disturbance, ensure the proposed structures including service buildings have a compatible architectural vocabulary. Mm. Regarding the comprehensive plan, the National, Garden, the National China Garden will provide a unique cultural destination at the Arboretum, and the project is consistent with parks and open space, federal environment, and preservation and historic feature elements. To conclude, is the Executive Director's recommendation is for the Commission to comment favorably on the concept design for the National Garden at the United States National Arboretum. And I will not go over the recommendations since I already explained it. And, and with this, I conclude my presentation and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Lee, very much. Commission members, <coughs> questions for Ms. Lee? Comments on the comments? On the comments. Uh, one small question. So the, the, the entire project is being donated, essentially. What about the ongoing maintenance of the facility? So they are donated the the design and the yes. construction is sixty two million and then the arboretum will assume maintenance. Okay. Thanks. You afraid you're gonna get it, don't you? Oh. <laughs> <Mr. Chair. laughs> we don't take gifts like that. Yeah. Yeah. We don't take gifts that where people are gonna give no, except for except when the Congress tells us to. Yeah, understood. Gifts, right. Chair. Yes, sir. Uh, you mentioned the uh, benches. I wonder whether there could be also some possible tables. I know that's kind of minor, but uh, I'm kind of big on furniture being used by the public. And people come out there a lot and want a picnic. I think that's approved. And they need some places to set things sometime rather than just holding their lap. So if you could add some tables to maybe there's a way they can figure to put those in. I don't know. I used to go there a lot, but I know a lot of folks that just come to picnic. It's nice to have a place to sit down and to maybe set things, maybe. I don't know. Thank you. Other questions? Hearing none, is there a recommendation on, is there a motion on the ADR? So moved. It's been moved and seconded. Second. No further discussion. All in favor of the EDR is presented, say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Thank you, Ms. Lee. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lee. You're done for the day. Agenda item number 5D is the preliminary site and building plans for the Franklin Park Rehabilitation. Ms. Ridgely. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the Commission. The National Park Service, in cooperation with the District of Columbia and the Downtown DC BID, has submitted preliminary site and building plans to the Commission for rehabilitating Franklin Park. Today, I'll provide background on the location and history of the park. Uh, I'll then walk through the preliminary site plan and review some recommendations for its four key components, the pedestrian mall and cafe, the children's garden, the central plaza and fountain, and finally, the landscape design. And finally, I'll wrap up with the executive, executive director's recommendation and answer any questions. Um, at this time, I'd also like to point out that we have staff representatives from the District of Columbia and, and as well as partners from the downtown DC bid um, in the National Park Service here today. Located at 14th and I Streets Northwest, Franklin Park serves a unique role in Washington's historic park system. Unlike many of the other downtown parks, Franklin's significance isn't pulled directly from its strategic placement within the law fought plan. Uh, instead, the park takes advantage of its former role as a protector of the White House's primary water source. This happened in the early 1800s, and it's a spring that ran through this block in downtown Washington. The park's unique history is one of the key reasons that the NPS, District of Columbia, and downtown DC bid chose to pursue a rehabilitation of this park. It's a place that blended its deep roots in the history of Washington with neighborhood park uses, distinguishing itself from other parks. 
This ecological function heavily influenced the park's design. Emphasis was placed on an organic layout, in incorporating meandering pathways, as you can see here, a large tree canopy and understory plantings not typically seen in other downtown parks. As such, its value as an open space is derived from this more naturalistic setting and break from the typical park pattern established by the L'Enfant grid. This attracted many residents to the park, which served as a neighborhood destination throughout much of the 19th and 20th centuries. In addition to serving as a thriving uh, daytime employee location, the area around the park has seen significant growth in the residential population over the past 10 years. The downtown bid population is now nearing 10,000 residents, and many see Franklin as their neighborhood park and expect a level of upkeep and programming similar to downtown parks in other great cities such as New York, Chicago, and Portland. At 4.8 acres, it's one of the largest parks in downtown, as well as one in need of significant capital and programmatic improvements. This diagram identifies the existing park and adjacent ground floor building conditions. Some of the park elements you can see here include the central fountain, Commodore Berry statue to the west, and strong connections to transit with bus stops throughout. Surrounding the park, the McPherson Metro Station is located on the block just southwest of the park, and ground floor uses surrounding the park include a number of restaurants, banks, and the Franklin School, uh, which is just to the east of the park. The district did receive proposals for development of that school in October and in the process of reviewing them. Proposal concepts range from more typical uses that you'd see downtown, such as office, um, to those focused more on educational and cultural opportunities. have to apologize that the slide's not advancing. There we go. So today, um, the park is used primarily by nearby employees visiting for lunch. Food trucks often park along the 13th and K Street sides, uh, and people do use the lawn for an impromptu picnic, often because the functional seating in the park is limited. Um, Franklin does host some limited but diverse events in the, when, in the warmer months, uh, and it also serves as a location for homeless services where nonprofit organizations can come to provide food, clothing, and other necessities for those in need. Upkeep of the park does remain a challenge. As with many downtown parks, aging infrastructure is increasingly difficult to maintain, uh, and that deferred maintenance is growing. Elements such as the central fountain shown on the bottom right here no longer function. This has led NPS to form a collaborative partnership with the district and bid to revitalize the park. The partners have worked with the greater downtown community since 2012 uh, to identify the park's new program, develop a new design for the park, and coordinate some ongoing operational needs. Uh, they also have hired the consultant team of Olin, CGF, and HRNA to help develop the design work under review today. Here's a preliminary site plan. It was developed through the NEPA and Section 106 process that concluded with an issuance of a FONSI uh, by the MPS in June. The project will rehabilitate Franklin Park from its current state into a modern urban park, meeting the needs of a growing downtown Washington population, nearby employees, and visitors to Washington. The new design respects much of the ex is existing historic park infrastructure, including the central fountain, which you can see here in the center. Um, the circulation system and pedestrian mall with cafe down to the, ooh, I apologize for this. Something is, there's a ghost in the machine. Um, okay, so we have the, um, the pedestrian mall and cafe to the south, the central plaza and fountain um, right here in the middle, a new children's garden on the east side of the park. Um, there's also going to be a, a respect for much of the existing park infrastructure here, including um, the Commodore Berry statue and the circulation system. Sustainability is a critical component of the design. Uh, the design includes installation of an underground cistern for the park located beneath the pedestrian mall to the south. It'll collect and reuse stormwater for irrigation throughout the park as well as the cafe's gray water needs. Staff is supportive of this new system for the park and recommends including additional design details related to sustainable design features for the submission. Oh, and now it's advancing, okay. Um, this is the paving plan uh, and this identifies um, some of the Yes, this is the paving plan. So the cistern underneath the, the southern area will be used to capture runoff from the park's pathways. As mentioned earlier, the paving plan does respect much of the existing path network, and minor modifications include ADA access throughout the park, as well as a widening of the southern walkway into a pedestrian mall. 
The current path is approximately 20 feet wide, uh, and it will be widened to approximately 35 feet to accommodate seating, historic interpretive elements, and events such as farmers markets and temporary exhibits. So here's an image of the Pedestrian Mall and Cafe looking west towards 14th Street. For the MOA signed on June 3rd, 2015, pursuant to the National Historic Preservation Act, staff recommends integrating cultural and historic interpretive features on the history of Franklin Park within the pavement area of the Pedestrian Mall to engage visitors and activate the space. A new cafe is proposed just south of the Pedestrian Mall near I Street. At approximately 2,100 square feet, the cafe is comparatively smaller to other local cafes like the National Gallery of Arts Sculpture Garden uh, or the cafe at Canal Park, both of which are about 4,000 square feet. Precedent does exist for a structure in Franklin Park. The 2005 Cultural Landscape Inventory, updated in 2011, identifies plans from 1886 showing a lodge with restrooms located just west of the fountain. Uh, by 1913, that lodge was relocated to East Potomac Park, and a second lodge was constructed on the 13th Street side. Uh, it was re removed around 1974. While the loss of open space is typically a key staff concern, the precedent of a lodge and need for comfort amenities in downtown Washington helps justify the inclusion of an appropriate, situ situated, and modest cafe. Locating the new cafe in the southwest corner will help draw visitors from points downtown, the McPherson metro station, and those waiting for buses along that heavily used I Street corridor. Amenities include a small interior restaurant space, restrooms, and a modest office space for park staff. The office space will help ensure that there are eyes on the park, an element that has been shown to improve safety. Staff notes the inclusion of restrooms are a much needed amenity for the park and recommends accessing the restrooms through the interior cafe space as well as providing more flexible access based on the type of, or time of day to support safe use of the facilities. While the design is still in, preliminary, uh, in a preliminary phase, design goals for the cafe include an appropriately scaled and transparent building that supports an 18-hour use of the park. Having a primary focus, having the building fo focus on the park um, and really acknowledge the street secondarily. Having a five-sided building, not just four walls, but an aesthetically pleasing and sustainable roof. A contemporary use of materials, including stone, wood, and glass. And finally, a building that in integrates into the stormwater and landscape systems and can be used all four seasons, uh, something that's climate responsive. So staff recommends providing further details regarding the design, materials, and construction of the cafe, including the green roof. Another, another new component of the park design is a children's garden. And again, according to the 2005 CLI, Franklin Park did contain a play space for the neighborhood children from the mid-19th into the early 20th centuries. It included a, a small sandbox, swings, and slides. So based on that legacy, the new rehabilitation design proposes an approximately 12,000 square foot space to serve as a children's garden. Taking its cues from the park's pastoral setting uh, and ecological context as part of the Potomac watershed, many of the proposed elements embody a more natural approach to play than typically found in Washington playgrounds. Staff is supportive of this departure from the more traditional play space as it embodies the spirit of Franklin Park, which continues to serve as a respite from the urban activity of downtown Washington. This slide shows some of the play elements proposed for the preliminary design, including natural elements such as boulders and more traditional play elements reimagined in a natural setting like climbing bars and slides. For the final submission, staff recommends identification of the type and location of the specific play elements to be with, um, included in the children's garden. In addition to the play elements, there are four fencing options that are currently under consideration for the area, and as safety is of the highest importance in a children's play space, staff recommends inclusion of an additional design detail on the play elements in the final submission, and also recommends use of the living fence identified in the preliminary designs fencing options. That's the second one listed here. So moving on to the central plaza and fountain, uh, a broken fountain, overgrown tree canopy, safety concerns, and lack of comfortable seating contribute to the current underutilization of Franklin's Park, Franklin Park's central area. It really no longer draws people to what once was the most striking feature of the park. Today, the central area is barely used. So throughout the NEPA and 106 process, members of the public advocated for a more usable and interactive water feature and a safe space to enjoy the park. Design goals for the fountain area include a reuse of the historic coping uh, and maintaining the overall form of the fountain, making the edge more engaging, and providing a, more, uh, a bolder and, and more engaging water display to draw in visitors to the center part of the park. 
The rehabilitation plan proposes an overall reduction in the size of this area. Currently, it's about 120 feet by 175 feet, um, and reducing it down to approximately 108 feet by 160 feet. But the space is opened up to additional sunlight, seating would be provided, and the historic fountain is reimagined as a more interactive water feature. Pieces of the fountain's flagstone and coping that do remain viable uh, would be reused in this new design, and it would raise the coping up to accommodate a more informal seating area. As with the other new park elements, staff recommends additional details on the plaza and fountain design as part of the final submission. As shown in the rendering, these improvements provide a safer and more attractive space during the day, um, but it can also support special evening events, such as movies and other community gatherings in the evenings. While I've highlighted individual elements of the park so far, the landscape is really the piece that ties this whole place together. With its meandering paths and significant tree canopy, Franklin Park serves as an organic counterpoint to the more structured character of downtown Washington. The rehabilitation plan continues to respect the park's role, though this will require this, the removal of a significant amount of the landscape in order to ensure its long-term integrity. So the design goals for the landscape include incorporating trees and understoring plantings with seasonal interest, use of native and naturalized lower maintenance species where possible, providing plantings that thrive in rain gardens to help treat stormwater on site, referencing previous palettes of the park, the history of the park from um, its lush quality and color to using landscape to actually create rooms within the park. And last but not least, providing a variety of plants tolerant to the existing conditions of the park. The plan does call for the removal of 46 trees, many of which are in poor or very poor condition. You can see them listed up here on the slide. But the overall health of the tree canopy will significantly improve with the planting of 43 new trees. Staff notes that opening up the canopy and allowing natural light to filter into the park will provide a more pleasant and hospitable setting for visitors. It will also uh, allow for the restoration and long-term maintenance of the understory plantings as well as the turf areas throughout the park. Potential understory plantings are native to the Mid-Atlantic, they're urban tolerant, and provide a variety of color and textures throughout the year. Overall, Franklin Park presents a unique opportunity for the National Park Service, District of Columbia, and the downtown bid to pool resources and transform this location. This public-private partnership is one of the 2010 Capital Space Plan's big ideas to enhance center city parks. Through this partnership, the park will accommodate local and national user groups, develop an underutilized park space that's really full of potential, uh, and operate new park amenities suitable for a downtown audience. NPS and the district are, in the, are currently in the process of negotiating a cooperative management agreement, or CMA. This provides a collaborative framework to explore opportunities to establish a governance structure and procedures that will allow Franklin Park to be operated and maintained by the partners as seamlessly as possible. Upon execution of the CMA, the district plans to provide the capital funds necessary for the construction. It's anticipated that construction drawings will be completed next year, and the park will be completed in 2017. Uh, based on the analysis of the project submission, it's the executive director's recommendation that the commission approve the preliminary site and building plans for the rehabilitation of Franklin Park. Um, and further recommendations on the final submission are included uh, in the EDR. This concludes my presentation, Mr. Chairman. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Ridgely. It's a very exciting project. It's a fun project. Big change. Can't wait for 2017 to come. Right. <laughs> Mr. May, you have thoughts on this? You want to defer to anybody else? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, we do have a speaker. Uh, Ms. Jones. Um, there's a public comment. Uh, section we have we're pleased to have Ms. Ellen Jones of the Downtown Business Improvement District. So welcome Ms. Jones. You have Thanks. you have five minutes. All right. I am Ellen Jones. I'm the director of infrastructure and sustainability for the downtown DC bid. Franklin Park is the largest park in downtown DC as Sarah told you. It has been under resourced, under managed and underdeveloped for half a century. Properties in the vicinity of Franklin Park have an abiding interest in improving what is now and has been a long time a blighted area in the center of our downtown. The Business Improvement District welcomed the renewed interest in Franklin Park by the National Park Service and the District Office of Planning in 2010. These three entities, the BID, Park Service, and OP, as you have heard, formed a planning partnership and established a shared vision for the park. 
As part of its contribution to the planning process, the bid conducted two years of research on best practices in 22 urban parks, six of which were owned by the National Park Service. We met with park designers, managers, and adjacent commercial property owners across the country to get an understanding of vibrant urban parks from both an economic development point of view and a quality of life perspective. We toured park fountain pumping rooms in Rose Kennedy Greenway in Boston and Dilworth Plaza in Philadelphia to learn more about the scope of ongoing maintenance and capital replacement requirements for park amenities in urban spaces. We visited more than a few public restrooms from Dallas to Manhattan to see how it's possible to operate them successfully. We asked about business plans for Director's Park in Portland and security operations in Canal and Yards Park in the District of Columbia. And we also talked off the record with the management of Glen Echo Park as to what it's like to be a management entity for a National Park Service property. Finally, we learned about rat management from Union Square in New York City, what better place? From this research effort, the bid came to believe that a transformed Franklin Park was a worthy investment opportunity for both the public and private sectors. The bid has been and continues to be engaging property owners and businesses in the vicinity of the park to inform them about the opportunity to improve the park and the role they can play in ensuring that there are sufficient operating and maintenance funds as well as management oversight to sustain the park over time. We've come this far because of the strong leadership from both within the district government and the National Park Service. The district government early on understood that a revitalized park meant a more livable community for residents, workers, and visitors in downtown. The district government provided the initial funding for planning to kickstart the endeavor, and through two administrations, the city has remained encouraging of a better Franklin Park. I have to single out Bob Vogel, who's now regional director of NC, uh, NPC, NPS's National Capital Region, and formerly the superintendent of the National Mall and Memorial Parks when we started this journey. Bob has consistently said, we can do that as we explored what it meant to make Franklin a vibrant 21st century urban park. And Deputy Superintendent Steve Lorenzetti helped the planning team navigate crucial early stages of this intergovernmental planning process, which we believe should serve as a model for future district NPS planning partnerships. Thanks for this opportunity to express the support of the downtown DC bid for both the plan before you, the people, and the processes that created it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jones, very much. That ends the public comment period, and we'll return it to the commission. So oh. move. It's been moved. Is there a second, and then we'll engage in any discussion? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Further discussion? Mr. Mr. May, and then Mr. Shaw. Thank you. Uh, so we're very excited to get to this point and have reach another uh, milestone in the process of uh, you know, the rebirth of, uh, of Franklin Square. Um, first of all, I just want to say we're grateful to the district's interest in willingness to uh, uh, not just talk about making improvements, but actually put um, a lot of money into doing it. Uh, and we're very grateful for that because if left to our own resources, it could take a while for us to realize anything close to this. And frankly, it wouldn't be as aggressive as what we are doing now. Um, we're also grateful to the downtown bid for all of the studies that they've done and everything that, that uh, Ms. Jones just recounted, their participation through their process and, uh, and their leadership in trying to find the right operating model. Um, and that is a crucial part of this. Um, it, it's great to be able to reinvent the park, but it doesn't work if we can't find the right way to operate it into the future and maintain it. And uh, I think we're well on our way, again, thanks. Um, and to a great extent to the, uh, the downtown bid and their efforts. Um, we are working through the process of establishing the Cooperative Management Agreement. This is uh, new territory for us, uh, not just in this region, but generally in the Park Service. There aren't very many of these. Um, but we do have an explicit authority to do it, and so we're pursuing it, and we are hopeful that it will become a model for uh, future cooperative projects, uh, perhaps not as a uh, dramatic as this, but certainly uh, operationally very, very helpful and uh, good for the Park Service, good for the district, good for the citizens, good for our visitors. So uh, thank you all very much, and I look forward to the approval. Thank you, Mr. Mike. Mr. Shaw. Hey, Mr. Chair, um, what a cool project, by the way. Um, 
I think everyone took the talking points. I just want to reiterate just the hard work that's come in terms of the partnership um, and the model and just really stress that this is a, a mayor's priority project for, for really bringing green space and um, to, to a growing center city and really as a model for how we, we think about partnerships with um, private interests, the National Public Park Service, um, and the district on other green spaces. Um, I also acknowledge the Office of Planning staff and Thor Nelson is here on our part for really um, thinking about design. And if you guys don't know, our, our office is really committed to um, lifting up the idea of urban design a lot more than the district and understand how it works within a unique context of um, us being a federal city. Thanks. And so just in that instance, I just wanted to recognize that and just um, I'm contained in my excitement, but it's in my heart. My heart's, I'm, my hands are sweating right now. I'm so excited. I just want to vote. So uh, there you go. Thank you very much. Let me make a quick comment, Mr. Chairman. Um, just keeping on all this praise. But I just wanted to say, make a comment from my own position that I think the, the bid has done an amazing job in directing a design that from what I've seen in this uh, 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 presentation and, and before has really created a very active and passive park, which are critical for urban areas. The one, two other dynamics that I found most intriguing was how they actually included the young and the old in the same park mm -hmm. and not necessarily segregate out those issues, but it seems to work fairly well together and integrate overall. And then for me, I think one of the most exciting pieces is the addition of that cafe because that just, it just blends all sorts of opportunities to relax, to be, sit around, have a cup of coffee and enjoy the city like we should. So. That's what I have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good. Thank you very much. Chairman. Sure. Please. Um, I've got a question, I guess, on the overall management of uh, how the deal is going to work. So, I mean, we toured Pershing Park this morning. You can see what happens when a park becomes underutilized, when the concessionaire moved out and all that. In a situation like this, I don't know, is it, are we envisioning the bid is going to manage the day-to-day? -day? I mean, the operation maintenance going forward, the ownership of all the structures of the district's building and funding it. Can Park Service come in and knock down the the restrooms and all that. I mean, I don't know if anyone could speak a little bit more to the management structure that's envisioned. So, um, you know, the exact management structure hasn't been established, but it's being studied very carefully. And uh, I mean, I think there's a plan to uh, fund an entity that would manage, <coughs> wouldn't be managed by Department of Parks and Recreation or the Park Service. It would be this third party uh, that may be the bid or maybe a subsidiary of the bid or something like that. Um, but the, the key thing is making sure that the funding is in place to, to provide that. And, and I think that we're well on our way to establishing that. It does, it will require some action on the part of the district to, I think, make sure that that funding structure is in place uh, and that, it's, uh, that it makes sense. Um, and the cooperative management agreement essentially will cede to the district as an, an extensive uh, authority over the, the park. So we're not, um, it, it, even though it'll be a cooperative management agreement, all of our roles will be, I think, clearly defined in terms of what we can do and what we can't do, and there won't be any sort of abrupt actions on anybody's part to undermine the operations in the long run. Um, it's a long-term commitment that we're making. I just want to echo that it's been an ongoing conversation as well. So internally on the, on the district administration side, and then we've had a number of public meetings with the bid, um, talking about contributions and calculations, and really trying to understand the costs. So I know um, for you, we want to have a realistic budget, and I know that um, we're looking at the capital budget side, and the mayor's looking as she submits her budget to council at some moment about understanding the real cost and investment that's needed to make this project really work. Why? I really appreciate that question um, as somebody who works in parks development every day. And I, I commend the team for thinking about maintenance and a cooperative management structure while you're designing it because it, it will be critical to the success of the park. But um, in terms of the level of research, um, I'd love to have a copy of that study, by the way, yeah, of the 22 yeah. parks. I was listening for any Chicago parks that might have been on the list. but. I think that's really important to go around and see all the different ideas because there's there's such an interesting um, movement going on in terms of public-private partnerships when it comes to parks. So I, I really commend you for getting out there and doing that kind of research at that level. So I think it's a great project. So congratulations. Ms. Wright. Quick. I'll be quick because we get to talk about design today. <laughs> hey. and and what a design it is um, you know many have attempted and failed at 
uh, pastoral landscape design in an urban setting and pulled it off. Although we have many wonderful examples to learn from, we don't do it very well today. And this has all of the the hallmarks of um, at concept of, of the very real possibility of pulling it off. Right here in Washington, imagine that. <laughs> so my day is made and I won't say anything more. Thank you. <laughs> Dennis. Yeah, can I say something in, in my own voice for just for a sec? <laughs> I, it, this is just my, my own observation, but I think that Jeff Bezos in the Washington Post did a great thing uh, by uh, moving their headquarters a few blocks away to this location and helping to keep uh, this uh, great city uh, revitalized, and uh, which is uh, an ongoing an ongoing project that means a lot to uh, to all of us. Thank you, Mr. Dennis. Sensing no further discussion, it's been moved and seconded. All in favor of the EDR say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Ridgeley. Item 5E is approval of comments on the site selection for the Gold Star Mothers National Monument site selection. Mr. Fliss, I believe, I believe this is your first time before us? It is. Thank Welcome. You. Uh, Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the Commission. The National Park Service, on behalf of the Gold Star Mothers National Monument Foundation, has submitted proposed sites for the Gold Star Mothers National Monument for your review and comment. To provide a brief process overview, Congress authorized the installation of the Gold Star Mothers National Monument with Public Law 113-239. The law states that the Commemorative Works Act, or CWA, applies to the site selection and design of the monument. The CWA is a federal law that guides the memorials process in D.C. and its environs. The Act also provides some guiding criteria for site selection, which are helpful for this project. They include, first, situating the work in surroundings that are relevant to the content of the monument, locating the work so that it does not interfere with an existing commemorative work, and also locating the work while protecting open space, existing public use, and cultural and natural resources. At this point in the process, the Commission of Fine Arts and the National Capital Memorial Advisory Commission, or NICMAC, and NCPC provide agency consultation on potential sites. NICMAC has an advisory role on commemorative works within the district and its environs, while CFA and NCPC have approval authority on site and design. CFA and NICMAC have already reviewed and commented on the alternative sites, and after our commission comments, the applicants will develop designs within the preferred site. In the future, the site and design will return to our commission for preliminary and final approval. To just provide you some background, the term Gold Star Mothers arose during World War I to describe mothers and families who would place gold stars in their windows or on service flags, representing service men and women who were lost to war. Blue stars and flags represented family members fighting in the war. If the member died, a gold star replaced it. This allowed members of the community to know the price that the family had paid in the cause of freedom. The proposed monument aims to recognize mothers for their role in raising and shaping the service men and women who have given so much to this country, while at the same time educating the public about the history of the term and the role of mothers in supporting this nation. Working together, the National Park Service and the Foundation developed a list of criteria to guide the evaluation and selection of a site for the monument. These criteria parallel the site selection guidance found within the Commemorative Works Act, but provide more detail. These are shown on the screen before you. In particular, uh, particularly important are the criteria for ease of access, a meaningful context, contemplative character, and accommodation to groups of visitors. Taken together, the CWA guidance and the applicant selection criteria offer sound standards for evaluating the site alternatives. 
In particular, locating the work to satisfy these criteria will be cr critical to a successful monument that accommodates the needs of visitors. Now moving along to the sites, as mentioned previously, the public law permits the establishment of a monument and particularly notes that it may be uh, located within Area 1 or Area 2, but outside the reserve of the National Mall. The reserve includes this area hatched in red on your screen, which includes the cross-axis of the National Mall. Area 1 includes everything within the dark, bold line here, and Area 2 is everything outside that line. With this guidance, the applicant considered four potential sites for the location of the monument. These sites include two in the District of Columbia, one of, which, one of which has been dismissed, and two within the Commonwealth of Virginia. All sites are controlled by the National Park Service. These include Site A, Pershing Park, which has been dismissed, Site B, which is a Belvedere located south of the Theodore Roosevelt Bridge, Site C, a niche located along Memorial Avenue, and Site D, an uh, area adjacent to the Arlington National Cemetery Visitor Center. Very briefly, I, I mentioned that Site A was dismissed. Um, Congress has designated this for the National World War I Memorial, and you will hear more about that project at the following information presentation. Moving to Site B, this is located at Belvedere along Rock Creek Parkway, adjacent to the Potomac River. For reference, the Belvedere is intended to provide a scenic view or vista. In this case, the view is of the Potomac River and its surrounding shorelines. The site is immediately across from a confluence of several busy streets, as well as some active recreational areas, uh, some volleyball courts. The Kennedy Center is located to the north, across the bridge, um, uh, across from the elevated Memorial Bridge, um, Theodore Roosevelt Memorial Bridge. This site meets four of the five CWA site selection guidance and five of the 11 site selection criteria. These are some uh, images of the existing site. It is comprised of a circular landscape island approximately 45 feet in diameter, separated from Rock Creek Park Trail by a vehicle layby. The promontory which forms the Belvedere is made up of a grassy area approximately 25 feet wide and 140 feet long. Two benches can be found on either side of the Belvedere facing the trail. Of the three sites under consideration, this location holds the least opportunity for quiet and contemplation. The adjacent roadway and nearby active recreational uses do not lend themselves to peaceful reflection. And although the lay-by could be used for vehicular drop-off, this would directly intrude on the site. The site also provides some views of the Arlington National Cemetery grounds in the distance. Um, as such, the monument could have some relationship to this backdrop provided by the cemetery, but its distance is diluted, dilutes this connection. In addition, Rock Creek Park Trail is heavily used by bicyclists and joggers and may preclude the opportunity for a functioning gather gathering space. As such, the limited opportunity for contemplative space and weak con contextual connection to the Arlington National Cemetery make this a challenging site for the proposed monument. Therefore, staff does not support locating the monument at Site B. Moving on to Site C, this is located along Memorial Avenue, the primary entrance to the Arlington National Cemetery, formed by the axis connecting Lincoln Memorial and Arlington House. Um, a series of niches occurs along the corridor and are occupied by a variety of commemorative works. These include the Seabees Memorial, the 101st Airborne Division Memorial, and the 4th In Infantry Division Monument. The avenue terminates at the western end at the Women in Military Service for America Memorial. Under this option, the Gold Star Mothers Monument would occupy a newly created niche um, along the corridor. This site meets all five of the CWA site selection guidance and seven of the 11 site selection criteria. The niches along Memorial Avenue are typically 30 feet wide and 20 feet in depth. The original plan for the Memorial Bridge and Avenue project is shown on the screen. You can see the series of niches established along the western end of the corridor. The Lincoln Memorial is located to the right on the screen. The niches are formed by creating a setback within the hedge line which defines the length of the avenue with each niche located about 20 feet back from the sidewalk. And you can see that here in this image. The niches along the, the dominance of the Memorial Avenue axis and the recessed nature of the niches results in memorials which are viewed as a series of objects placed along the landscape of the corridor. 
No pedestrian connections are provided from the sidewalk to the memorials uh, along the corridor. As such, they must be viewed at a distance. Given the setting, staff believes it would be challenging to create a contemplative, contemplative space in Site C. Further, the site's location within the context of the Arlington National Cemetery provides a thematic connection to the proposed monument. Staff notes, however, that many of the memorials uh, within the existing niches are dedicated to military, military service groups, which is somewhat thematically different than, those, than families of those in service. In addition, the nature of the established niche design creates a series of challenges that appear incompatible with the site selection criteria. <coughs> in particular, the niche's location al along the highly tra traveled avenue may not permit the creation of a contemplative space, and the setback does not accommodate a gathering space for visitors to engage the monument. Therefore, the limited opportunity for contemplative space and lack of gathering space make Site C a challenging site for the proposed monument. Finally, moving to Site D, this is an area of lawn and trees located immediately to the west of the existing Arlington National Cemetery Visitor Center. This is highlighted in yellow. A tour bus and transit center is located immediately to the south, and the visitor center is located here. A sidewalk passes through the site connecting Schley Drive and the cemetery grounds to the west with the visitor center. The site area is approximately two acres in size, uh, measuring 190 feet by 450 feet. This site meets all five of the CWA site selection guidance and all 11 of the site selection criteria. For another view, this plan again shows the site in reference to the visitor center in Memorial Avenue. This is the location. Of the three sites, this location holds the best opportunity for quiet contemplation. The size of the site and the setbacks from the adjacent uses could permit both a monument and a gathering space for visitors. Site D is located near the Arlington Cemetery and Metro Station, and parking and bus service is provided near the visitor center. This site's location within the context of this cemetery also provides a strong thematic connection to the proposed monument. Staff therefore finds that the proposed memorial site is adequate, adequate for a modest sized memorial and encourages the National Park Service to continue to evaluate this site for the future monument. At a future date, the Park Service will submit the monument design for approval. Staff recommends that the sponsor develop a range of alternative designs for Site D that include further detail regarding the exact placement within the site, the relationship of the monument to the surrounding site features, and the monument's orientation. Given the expected modest scale of the monument, it will be important to understand how the work will be placed within the larger landscape provided by Site D. Staff further notes that, the additional, that additional coordination with Arlington National Cemetery will be necessary regarding this site. The Arlington National Cemetery Real Property Master Plan indicates potential utility lines bisecting the western portion of the site. These should be further evaluated as alternative designs are developed. In addition, the proposed design should carefully consider the surrounding context of the cemetery grounds. In summary, when evaluating the four sites with the CWA guidance for site selection, sites C and D best meet all criteria, though site D has a stronger thematic connection to the proposed monument than site C. Likewise, when evaluating the sites against the applicant's site selection criteria, Site D meets all the desired criteria. Therefore, it is the Executive Director's recommendation that the Commission support selecting Site D, the area adjacent to the Arlington National Cemetery Visitor Center, as a preferred location for the Gold Star Mothers National Monument, based upon its strong thematic context, opportunity for visitor gathering space, contemplative character, and lack of impact on existing circulation or activities. In addition, the Commission recommends that the sponsor develop a range of alternative designs with Site Area D, including variations in scale, material palette, placement, and orientation. The next submission to reveal de details about the physical relationship of the monument to the surrounding context and information about the program needs at the site. Further recommends that the National Park Service and the sponsor continue to coordinate with the Arlington National Cemetery regarding Site D, the including the location of existing utility lines and the design and placement of the proposed monument. Finally, does not support Site B due to its limited opportunity for contemplative space, inadequate accessibility, and weak contextual connection to Arlington National Cemetery. 
That concludes my presentation. I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, the representatives from National Park Service as well as the architect for the sponsor are here. Perfect. Thank you, Mr. Fliss, very much. Commission members? Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Sensing uh, no discussion and wild approval for Site D. Um, is there a motion? So moved. It's been moved and seconded. Mr. Shaw, did you have something? Oh, it's been moved and seconded. All in favor of the EDR is presented, say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Thank you very much. Gotcha. <coughs> Excuse me. Agenda item number 6A is an information presentation of the World War I Memorial. And we have Mr. Fliss. I believe this is your second time before us. Thank you. These remaining two presentations are information only, so there are no more, no more votes to take. Again, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the Commission, the National Park Service, along, the world, along with the World War I Centennial Commission, are here today to provide an information presentation regarding the proposed World War I Memorial to be located at Pershing Park along Pennsylvania Avenue within the District of Columbia. Uh, many of you were able to visit the site today, but just briefly, I'd like to provide some context and history. In 2014, Congress authorized the World War I Centennial Commission to honor the service of members of the U.S. Armed Forces in World War I at the site of Pershing Park. The law also recognizes the Liberty Memorial in Kansas City as a national memorial and restricts encroachment on the District of Columbia War Memorial. Pershing Park is located along Pennsylvania Avenue, um, between 14th and 15th streets. Um, the Willard Hotel is located to the north, Freedom Plaza is located to the east, um, and the Sherman Monument is located to the west. The site was originally conceived as private lots in LaFont's 1791 plan for the city of Washington. It was not originally planned as a park. The image on the screen shows a view of the site looking up Pennsylvania Avenue towards the White House and the Department of Treasury building um, in, the, in the 1880s. The Willard Hotel is clearly visible on the right, and on the subject property you can see a mix of private development. Over time, the property changed use, eventually moving from private ownership to federal control, and a temporary build an information building was built on the site during World War II. That was later demolished in 1955. In 1972, the Pennsylvania Avenue Development Corporation, the PADC, was created to oversee comprehensive revitalization efforts for the corridor. And in 1979, it commissioned M. Paul Friedberg and Jerome Lindsay to design Pershing Park. Under Friedberg, the park was reimagined as a shaded refuge with waterfall and sunken water feature that transformed into an ice rink in the winter. The park design reflected a desire for seclusion from the noisy streets surrounding the site while seating, restrooms, and a cafe were also provided. A memorial to General Pershing, uh, previously designed, was also integrated into the park plan. The park was later dedicated in 1981, and soon after, the landscape architects of Ohm van Sweden redesigned the planting plan, seeking to, in their words, soften and embellish Friedberg's concept. As I noted previously, Congress has now authorized the establishment of a commemorative work to honor uh, those who served in World War I by enhancing Pershing Park through new sculpture and other elements, including landscaping. Given this guidance, staff has already provided some initial scoping comments to be considered as the project progresses. These include, one, that the site should be evaluated for good urban design, and particularly it should combine both urban park and commemorative features successfully, blending park uses and a dignified commemorative components in an appropriate manner. Secondly, that Pershing Park should be evaluated for its historical significance, both as an individual park as well as an element of the PADC plan. A determination of historic eligibility will be completed, and it should be considered in the evaluation of the memorial and the park designs. 
In addition, staff believes that there are issues with the legibility and placement of the existing Pershing Memorial walls, and that relocating or redesigning these elements should also be evaluated in a comprehensive site design. And finally, as the project proceeds to environmental analysis, staff recommends that a variety of alternative designs be explored, including those that have a smaller scope and less impact on the existing park infrastructure. One alternative should also consider maintaining the park at the, level, the PADC service levels of the 1980s and 1990s. Now, given this background and context, a two-stage competition is currently underway to select a memorial design. I will now turn it over to Mr. Edwin Fountain uh, with the World War I Centennial Commission to provide an overview of the memorial process, their objectives and challenges, as well as a briefing on the designs as they currently stand. Mr. Fountain, welcome. Thank you, Matthew, and thank you, Chairman Bryant and members of the Commission for, uh, for, for giving us the opportunity to, to tell you where we are and what we're trying to accomplish and the various issues and challenges that we're, we're dealing with. <coughs> you have. Um, I am Vice Chairman of the U.S. World War I Centennial Commission. We are a federal commission. We were chartered by Congress in 2013 and given the broad mission of educating the American people about World War I, its causes and consequences, and the, uh, and the role of the American Armed Forces and the American population in that war, uh, and our contribution to the ultimate victory of the, of the, of the Allies in that conflict. Um, the Commission took on as one of its, uh, one of its primary, primary missions uh, the creation of a, national, a true national World War I memorial in Washington to complement the memorial in Kansas City. Uh, there are a variety of other World War I themed memorials in Washington, um, but not something that would be considered a National War Memorial on a par with those that we have, we have erected on the Mall. Uh, the Pershing Memorial itself uh, stands primarily as, and, and was conceived primarily as a memorial to General Pershing himself, uh, not so much a, a memorial to the overall war effort uh, with a focus on the, on the common soldier as we have since come to, to develop through memorials on the Mall. We do, of course, have national memorials to the to three of the four major wars of the 20th century on the Mall. Were we working from a blank slate, we would we would be talking about a site on the Mall. Uh, before the commission was formed, there were efforts to to establish such a memorial on the Mall, either on a on a standalone basis or by expanding the scope of the DC War Memorial. Uh, but those efforts ran into the Commemorative Works Act and and other issues. Uh, and ultimately, ultimately did not proceed. Uh, the commission, my commission, being fully briefed of those efforts, <coughs> decided not to fight to be on the wall, but, uh, but looked to what we considered the next best site, which is Pershing Park, given that it already has uh, a memorial to General Pershing, and therefore such a, a strong World War I element. Uh, but it is our, our, our objective to establish a memorial that that frankly stands on a par uh, with these other memorials that are on the that are on the mall, uh, and that's given the 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 overwhelming significance of World War One in our nation's history. Uh, it was a profoundly nation transforming and world transforming event. Uh, the United States emerged from the war in a very different posture and character than it entered the war, not just mil militarily, but in terms of the role of government in terms of uh, civil rights across various segments of population. Um, and, and that significance cannot be overstated, nor can the, the, the effects of the war on the subsequent century of world history. The conflicts we deal with today uh, around the world uh, can, be, can trace a straight line back to World War I. Uh, and the centennial being the last best opportunity to, to bring those issues to the consciousness of, of, of this country and the memorial serves not just a memorial, but, a, but an educational component uh, in that those two missions feed on each other. And a, and a, and a proper national memorial, we, we think, will inspire education about the war. So we went to Congress and asked for and received uh, approval to establish a war memorial at, at Pershing Park uh, by constructing at the park site appropriate sculptural, uh, sculptural and other commemorative elements, including landscaping, to further honor uh, to further honor the site, to, fur to further honor uh, the American Armed Forces in World War I. The site 
as it currently stands, in our view, has drawbacks as a memorial, starting with the existing Pershing elements themselves. <coughs> uh, first of all, the focus is on General Pershing himself. Uh, and while that's a, a perfectly fine likeness of the general, uh, it's not the most inspiring or evocative uh, statue or memorial sculpture that we have in this, in this city. Uh, the focus is on the general, not on the common soldier. Uh, on the wall to his left, on the right in that picture, is a very good history lesson about the war that, that we look forward to retaining in whatever design we proceed with. Uh, but it's just that, a history lesson. There's not one mention of, of the 116,000 lives lost in the war. Uh, it's a very top-level history lesson. The entire site lacks pathos, it lacks inspiration, it lacks an emotional content. Uh, in, in comparison, say, to the Grant Memorial, uh, the Iwo Jima Memorial at the opposite end of that, of that, uh, that stretch of, of the Monumental Corps uh, or the memorials on the Mall. Uh, and so, you know, it, it, the site needs more to stand as a proper war memorial. Within the existing park design, uh, the Pershing Memorial, we feel, is, is marginalized and shunted off physically to one corner of the site. The red box there denotes the the plaza that contains the Pershing Memorial, it occupies about one-eighth of the park site. And it, and it literally is shunted off to one corner. Uh, the central features of the park, in our, in our view, uh, don't relate to and, and even almost turn their back on, on the Pershing element uh, of the site. Uh, and so this is primarily, in our view, a park that happens to have a, a memorial feature. Uh, we would like to reimagine it as a as a as a park with a World War One feature as the central element, uh, but one that nevertheless exists harmoniously within a living, breathing, working urban park. Uh, but we feel in the current design it does not do that. There's then the challenge of the of the park in its existing state. Um, about eight years ago, uh, the use of the park as a uh, ornamental pool in the summer and an ice skating rink in the, in the winter was discontinued. Uh, we now have this, 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 this flat, open, barren slab uh, that is not inviting to anyone. We have the gazebo that is, that is no longer in use. And I understand some of you had the opportunity today to tour not just the site, but the underground infrastructure. And I had that same opportunity a couple weeks ago. Uh, it would take an awful lot to restore this site. Uh, and, and Mr. May, if I can, can put you on the spot as the representative of the Park Service today, I mean, I do think it's important as the public discussion goes forward about what to do with this site that we get some authoritative information about the factors that led the Park Service to discontinue use of this element of the park, uh, the factors that led the concessioner to withdraw from, from operating the gazebo, the resources and investment it would take to get it back in working order, and whether there's a business case to do so, whether there's a prospect of bringing a concessioner back to this site, you know, especially given that we've now, we subsequently, we've established a, frankly, bigger, better, more attractive ice skating rink at the National Gallery Sculpture Garden, and I believe there's another one due to come online at Constitution Gardens. Uh, that information is not in my commission's uh, purview, but it's information that we need to get out there as this conversation goes forward. Even were it a, a properly working uh, pool and, and, and ice skating rink, uh, again, we as the World War I Centennial Commission have reservations about it, uh, given other aspects of the site. Mr. Fleece re referred to the, to the berms surrounding a good half to two-thirds of the site. Um, that pose one of the challenges that we're really grappling with as we go forward. Because on the one hand, those berms do provide uh, a very good sense of enclosure and containment and seclusion within the site so that when you do step down into the amphitheater, you are to some extent visually and orally shielded from the surrounding street traffic and noise. Uh, but the flip side of that is that from most perspectives, the site is very uninviting and nothing draws you in or tells you that there's a that there's a memorial element or, or anything else there. Um, and, and so that's a challenge we feel with the existing design of the site from a perspective of, a, of a establishing a national memorial there. And it's a challenge that we're dealing with as we go forward in the design competition. 
So with those elements in mind, again, we come back to the statutory authorization, which is to construct additional commemorative elements on the site, including landscaping, to properly honor American veterans of World War I. Uh, and as Mr. Fleece pointed out, uh, Congress did put one restriction on us, which is that we not interfere with or encroach on the District of Columbia War Memorial. Uh, but it did not impose any other restrictions. So we frankly feel we have a charter from Congress to do, to first of all, uh, is that, uh, there's a recognition by Congress that the park in its current form does not stand as an appropriate National World War I memorial, uh, and that we have a charter to, to add elements to the site so that it does stand as such a memorial, and that Congress has given a certain authority to redesign the site, subject, of course, to the design, review, and approval pr provisions and proceedings of the CWA. So with all that in mind, as we've gone through this process, we've isolated you know, no less than six uh, distinct design challenges that we're working with, and I know you can't read that, but first is the first is the underlying design challenge of, of designing a proper uh, National World War I memorial that conveys the, the heroism and the magnitude of the sacrifice of American forces. And, and just to draw a comparison, again, to, again, we've got memorials to Korea and Vietnam Wars on the mall. Uh, we lost more American lives, 116,000 in World War I, than we did in those two wars combined. Uh, in six months in, Viet in, in World War I, we suffered more combat fatalities than we suffered in eight years in Vietnam. Uh, and so while recognizing that we are not on the mall, uh, we still are pleased to have pride of place on Pennsylvania Avenue, um, which, which we think is the most symbolically important uh, thoroughfare in, in, in the nation. Uh, but it is important to us to establish a memorial that, that completes that quartet of national memorials. <coughs> it needs to have a certain gravitas and grandeur, uh, which is not to say size or scale necessarily, uh, but the design needs to needs to properly convey the theme of, of, of this country's recognition and appreciation of the service and sacrifice of, of, its, of its veterans in that war. So that's the underlying design challenge. Then you have the wrinkle that, unlike those other three monument memorials, here we're talking about a memorial to a generation of veterans that is no longer with us. The last American veteran of World War I died in 2011. <coughs> uh, that has very interesting and, and significant implications for what is the theme of the memorial. Uh, the Vietnam Memorial is a place of grieving. The World War II Memorial is a, a, a place of, of celebratory and triumphal return. Uh, when you think about the honor flights coming into Washington and, and those veterans seeing the memorial to them. Those functions don't really apply to a World War I Memorial. And so what is the theme of the memorial? And that we're working through as we go through this. And it has implications for what's the appropriate design style of the memorial. Do you strive for something that was of that era? Um, or do you strive for something contemporary? Do you strive for something that, that, that will stand 100 years from now? Thirdly, we, uh, we, we, we recognize that unlike memorials on the mall that have, have only to, they only have to be a memorial, that this has to serve as both a memorial and a park. Uh, we have understood from day one and we have embraced the challenge uh, of incorporating a, a meaningful memorial and a well-functioning urban park. Um, but that does require the, the park and memorial elements to be meaningfully integrated so that they complement one another, so that the park elements do not distract from uh, or be inappropriate to a memorial theme. Uh, that's a challenge. Fourth, again, did I go four? Recognizing that we're not on the mall, uh, we don't have sort of the built-in audience of visitors to the mall that, that visit those war memorials. We need to attract people to this site, and how do you do that? Uh, and that, and that complements the, the, the idea of having a, an attractive park. How do you bring people to the site, but how do you make those attractions, again, appropriate to and complementary of uh, a war memorial? And again, how do you balance the, the sense of, of contemplative seclusion uh, with a park that is nevertheless inviting and visible to passers-by? Um, so those have been, been challenges for us. And then the fifth is to take into account the existing cultural resources at the site. Uh, we recognize that we, we, that we have to retain, of course, the existing Pershing Memorial elements, uh, how those get integrated into a larger, more comprehensive design uh, is something that we continue to work through. Uh, and then, of course, is, is Pershing Park itself and the Friedberg design. 
uh, and that's an ongoing discussion. The 2007 National Register nomination uh, for Pennsylvania Avenue, submitted by the District of Columbia Historic Preservation Office, uh, identified the Friedberg design of Pershing Park as a non-contributing element of, of Pennsylvania Avenue. Uh, but that conversation has continued and is evolving, and as Mr. Flee said, um, the Park Service and we have, have undertaken, have commissioned a determination of eligibility for the site, um, both in its own right and as a contributing feature of the Pennsylvania Avenue Historic Site. Uh, that study is underway, and we anticipate it will be completed and signed off on by the Park Service and the D.C. SHPO uh, come, come June next year. Uh, and so that will further inform the discussion. And then related to that, the last challenge is how does this site fit within Pennsylvania Avenue as a whole? Uh, and the design uh, principles that were put in place by the PADC and that, and that this agency and others are continuing to follow. So that's an awful lot to take on in one memorial project and it's been interesting and educational and, and at times frustrating to deal with those things. Um, we went about it through an open competition, um, which for a variety of reasons we considered was the, was the best way to go. Uh, and uh, we are coming up on the, we've, we've been through the first stage, we received about 360 submissions uh, and an independent jury uh, down selected to five finalists that we've been working with over the past several months. Throughout that process, we've been working in close consultation with your staff, as well as with staffs so of the various other stakeholders um, in, in this process to, to help guide and help sh shape those designs as, as they go forward. So I'm going to turn this over now to Roger Lewis, who is one of the competition managers that we retained and, uh, and presumably is familiar to you as, as one of the leading architectural voices in, in the city. Roger is, uh, as I say, one of our competition managers, so he's going to talk about how we structured the competition and the competition jury, uh, and he's going to take you through the five finalists that we're looking at, with the caveat that those were the initial submissions we received at the end of stage one, and as I say, we've been going through various consultations with the designers in the intervening months, so the designs have evolved beyond what you will see now, uh, and we've taken into account a lot of the issues that, that, I, that I just raised. So this is informational, but uh, we'll be getting the, the final submissions from those designers next week uh, and continuing with more uh, steps in the, in, the, in the review process <coughs> toward an eventual selection by my commission at the end of, next, end of January. Thank you, Mr. Fountain, very much. Mr. Lewis, welcome. And if we could move through the presentation expeditiously, that'd be great. Welcome. I, I will be as expeditious as possible. Thank you. And thank you for uh, allowing me to uh, address you. I think uh, the... Edmund summarized very well the general uh, approach to this competition. Uh, I think uh, you might be interested to know uh, uh, who our jurors were. Um, uh, it's, a, I think, a very um, respectable jury. Jennifer Wingate, who is an historian, associate professor at St. Francis College, uh, Brooklyn, uh, was on the jury. John Shortle, Brigadier General, retired Army. Uh, Harry Robinson, uh, FAIA. Uh, architect, former dean at uh, Howard University, uh, Ben Forge, who uh, was uh, the architectural critic for many years at the Washington Post, Maurice Cox, FAIA planning director now in the city of Detroit, uh, again a, a well-known, well-respected uh, architect and urban designer, Allison Williams, uh, FAIA, who is a um, principal of AECOM in San Francisco, California, and landscape architect, professor of landscape architecture, University of Massachusetts, Ethan Carr, uh, PhD, FS, FASLA, uh, was on the jury. And I mentioned the jury only because uh, what you are going to see here are uh, the five finalists that were selected by that jury to go forward into stage two, which is now underway and uh, it will, will conclude soon. So I think uh, if I can make this happen... So let me uh, just go through these as quickly as possible. I, uh, I don't know if you have seen these or not, so I'm going to be fairly, I'm going to assume that if you have questions, we can come back to them. But let me just uh, summarize each of them. Uh, this one titled Plaza to the Forgotten War uh, is 
uh, a scheme. It's a fairly simple to understand scheme. Let me, where do I point this? There we go. Um, this, this is a fairly straightforward uh, composition uh, that uh, tends to uh, rely for interpretive reasons, for interpretive purposes, excuse me, on the uh, installation of a number of uh, pylons that you can see, I think, in this uh, promenade or passage that goes diagonally through the site. Uh, this, this is a scheme that is actually being substantially modified. Uh, it's predicated, among other things, on having uh, a, a number of lights, uh, about 1,300 representing, each light representing 100 of the casualties of World War I embedded in the surface. And I, I, again, I don't know if you can see, see them very well, but uh, uh, let, me, let me try and summarize it. This is, uh, this is the scheme that is, uh, was entitled an American family portrait wall in the park. And, uh, oh good, you have stuff at your desk. Well then, uh, th this is certainly one of the more uh, original ideas, uh, boiling it down, a series of containers, boxes embedded in the ground, deployed through the, the park space. Uh, and uh, each one of them would contain a photograph, uh, would be sealed so that it would be permanent. And uh, as you can imagine, this is, a, this is involves uh, an element of, of a molecule, if you will, that can be deployed in a number of different ways. So this is perhaps one of the most flexible schemes uh, and uh, is going through uh, its transformations right now. Uh, they are proposing, in addition to these uh, elements embedded in the landscape uh, statuary, uh, the, the notion is that uh, this, is, this, this will be a combination of people walking through it and, and learning something about the war through images, through photographs, uh, and also being uh, made to think about what the, the, the war meant and what its consequences were for uh, the United States and the world. This, uh, this project uh, is a, uh, let me say, a neoclassical take on the competition uh, uh, intention that uh, creates a very simple site plan. The designer, his, his notion is that uh, what might be most appropriate here is a memorial that might look like it was designed in 1918. Uh, it's purposefully, uh, let me say, uh, stylistically retrospective. Uh, it is, uh, uh, I think that maybe is a better view. It involves the construction of a very substantial uh, monument that you can see uh, on, the, on the northern edge uh, opposite the Willard Hotel. Uh, it orients itself toward the Department of Commerce building to the south uh, with park spaces in the quadrants that are left over. Uh, outside of the oval, the figural space in the middle. I have to apologize, I can't see these real well. This, uh, this has been, the, the designers call this the hero's green. Uh, and uh, this is, uh, given that, that the goal it has been to create both an appropriate memorial and an appropriate urban park, uh, this team uh, has created a um, very much a, a park with two aspects to it, a, an area to the east opposite Freedom Plaza that is meant to sort of be uh, a, 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 con a, con a continuation, if you will, of the, of the uh, at-grade landscape of uh, the park to the east. And then on the western two-thirds, uh, they are proposing a new what they describe as a new type of public space, which is a series of uh, uh, elevated uh, embankments or hillocks. I'm not sure what to call them. Let me see if there's another picture. This is, here we go. Uh, that, <clears throat> that would be experientially very different from the eastern third, uh, and one moving through, those would, through, the, through that space would see walls with inscriptions or images inscri on the wall or on the walls, plural, uh, again, providing lessons and 
memories and quotations, etc., related to World War I. And this, this gives you, a, I think, a, a, an idea about what they're thinking and how this would work and how it would serve, again, at once as a commemorative and as a, as a park. The, um, the Weight of Sacrifice was the name given to this one by its designer. This is the one that comes closest to making use of the existing park composition and park uh, topography and park uh, design features. Uh, again, it's going through transformation, but I think you can see in this uh, that it looks a lot like the existing Pershing Park, at least in its ground plan. Whoops. I think I went too far. Uh, one of the things it does do is it brings the the grade, the elevation, I think you all have probably seen this part, uh, it brings the, the grade to, does this work? No, it doesn't work. Um, it brings the grade back up to street level instead of there being a depression in, in the center of the space. Um, and uh, at least in this stage one submission, keeps much of the, exi the existing elements, the berms and uh, some of the plantings uh, that exist now keeps them as part of the composition. And as I said, this too is evolving. So uh, I think, if I haven't left anything out, uh, we, could, we could obviously spend a lot of time talking about each one. We're not going to do that. Let me then take one more minute of your time and, and speak a little bit about my own assessment of this existing uh, park and why perhaps uh, it's worth considering at least some of these. Uh, landscape architect Paul Friedberg conceived the park to be a visually prominent but protected oasis. I mean, I think it's clear to anybody who's been there uh, that this was the goal, uh, to create a sense of spatial containment within the city and to punctuate three-dimensionally the end of Pennsylvania Avenue near the White House. Uh, so so you, you have seen the elements, and it's probably appropriate to leave this up here while I'm talking about these. Uh, you know that the, the high grass-covered berms around the perimeter separate and insulate the park's granite-paved interior and the sunken warm-weather pool, wintertime ice rink, and glazed pavilion uh, that, of course, once, once were used quite intensely, including by my wife, who was chief counsel at the Department of Commerce, and she used to ice skate there all the time, and she, she wonders why we're not saving the park as it is exactly. Um, Pennsylvania, excuse me, uh, in fact, only this notion of insulating it from the outer outside forces, uh, we ought to point. We should point out that, or I point out that, uh, it's really the east and west sides, 14th and 15th Street, that generate the noise. Uh, the Pennsylvania and East Streets, uh, pl flanking the north and south sides of the park, carry relatively little traffic and, and are relatively quiet. The four surrounding streets, though, do make the park an island from a traffic perspective. But uh, in my opinion, 35 years after this original park was designed, it seems to me inappropriate that this site should be designed, landscape viewed and operated as if it were a disconnected autonomous island, which is what it is today. Instead, uh, in my opinion, uh, a newly enhanced park should be woven into the city fabric, fulfilling its role both as inspiring memorial and activated civic park. So, uh, among the things that I think are problematic with the existing park are its lack of desirable functional, formal, and visual connectivity to the urban context and the evolving environment of Pennsylvania Avenue, including Freedom Plaza. Uh, and uh, it certainly, it certainly is, is not a place where you can go by and, and understand what it's about, what it means, what's happening in it. it it's intentionally meant, again, to be a, a bit of an oasis, and, and, and in that sense, uh, with its topography, uh, it, it remains still a mystery. Most people have no idea what that park is all about. So in my opinion, the, the Pershing Park, is, as, it's now, as it now exists, as it was designed, is, is, is contrary to the fundamental ways that we in the 21st century design spaces uh, that are civic spaces, public spaces in American cities, and certainly in the nation's capital. Uh, I think, I, th I, I would propose that the major design failings are fairly clear. Weak physical and functional relationships to the urban context, weak physical and functional 
excuse me, lack of visual porosity, uh, unwarranted obstructive topographic complexity, limited accessibility and on-site mobility, and, and, and of course surveillance and safety challenges deterring visitation. These, these are my views of why this park needed revisiting. And frankly, some of this might even apply to some of the proposals. Um, but I wanted to share that with you, just as, a, as someone who is a designer and who spends a lot of time uh, assessing design. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Lewis. Appreciate your expertise. Clearly, we have a lot of options before, us, uh, before you, and we look forward to the results of the design competition and learning more as you go. Mr. Mr. Shaw? I just, I'm just going to say this. Um, there's a building called the Wilson Building that exists with around here that happens to be City Hall. Um, and there's a very active downtown that continues to grow um, directly to the north. And I'm quite disappointed to see all these, to just see the same site over and over again. And so I don't know how we can, um, as you go through these conversations with um, the people who have submitted to really lift up the idea of number six of this being an urban park and urban context. You know, um, we're still trying to figure out what to do with Freedom Plaza as well. And, 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 you know, this is the front door of the nation's, the city hall, the nation's capital. And so um, there needs to be an opportunity. It's at the hinge of where sort of the core meets the city. And I just really feel like there needs to be um, some lifting up in the language and respect for for this being the front door um, of the city hall. And so, it just, it, once again, I'll say one time, it deeply concerns me to only see that square, to only see the perspective from the Willard, to not really understand that um, that the the unique un architecture of of the Wilson building um, can be something that contributes to the VISTA. So I'm just gonna put it out there. Thank you, Mr. Shaw. Another comment, Ms. White. Well, First, I just want to say how important I think this monument is, and to me personally, my grandfather served in World War I and was the president's bodyguard at the end of the war, so I've, I've grown up with uh, many, many stories about the impact of World War I on our country and our family. But I have to say from the designs that I'm looking at, the site visit we had this morning, and the design challenges or these um, objectives to defer appropriately to the Friedberg design, the five designs we're looking at obliterate the Friedberg design. So I'm just confused about the execution of the design competition. And I, I agree wholeheartedly about just the whole urban setting. It looks like something um, being set down that's completely different from its context. So just from an urban design perspective, I have some concerns about it. And, and it just seems every... Um, comment about the Friedberg design focuses only on its current condition. And I, I would just respectfully disagree that it's a failed design. I think it's failed maintenance, um, but I, I don't think it's failed design. So I, I just wanted to share that perspective. <coughs> Mr. Dix? Yeah, I have a few comments. First of all, I appreciate someone focusing on this space. Uh, I spent some time in the district building and knew when that was a space we thought about using. Uh, it seems to me that uh, beyond designing it now, uh, it, it may be some need to look back at what some of the flaws were in the previous structure, previous park, beyond the maintenance issue, uh, and some idea, and maybe this may lead into better design if you do it first rather than after, some survey of some of the folks who might use it. I mean, a simple survey within the Wilson Building went at the Willard to ask folks, well, what would they, what would Willard like to see there? What would the Wilson, what would, be, what would commerce folks would draw people out? What are we? And I think that that would help guide, maybe help with even some of the design work, so it meets some of those, provides for those needs. Uh, also, uh, sometimes it's not necessary, but it seems to me that an effort to try to offer some future programming uh, commitments rather than just do it, say, you know, we're going to plan to have something that the, that the commission, that your body can ongoingly commit to try to do to make this a useful and living living park. Uh, so programming. Also, I, I don't know how, how uh, 
in this food truck thing, he's got to get a little, get a little crazy, right, uh, Peter? I know with your properties. But, you know, it's a big thing. And uh, a lot of these government buildings can afford food trucks when they may not be able to want to afford or just the convenience of them. Of them. I don't know whether this will accommodate at certain times uh, food trucks since there's no food service being, I don't think, planned for it now, uh, that they could be built into the plan. I don't know whether it's set back or whatever, but and what, those are some of my thoughts. And I, I like to see it successful because it, it is a very potentially useful space. Uh, space people going to the White House for tours, going to the list for tours. They have a this is a place they could come by and go to. Uh, so, whatever you can do, the best to you, and hopefully we can be helpful in the process. Mr. Chair, yes, sir. Thank you. So, since this is the last item, I'll be reviewing as as a commissioner. Oh. I'm, I'm glad something I understand more than the other stuff. <laughs> Speaking in my own voice again. Uh, when, when the last veteran of World War I died, I, I attended the uh, lying in state, and it was deeply moving. Uh, the gentleman is certainly correct. There are no more veterans of, of World War I, but there are descendants of the veterans of World War I. And there are some in my family. I've seen the letters and the pictures, and uh, they're, they're deeply moving. And I think there are families all over uh, the country uh, who would share those uh, sentiments. Uh, this is such an appropriate project. Uh, there's an entity that you may be familiar with called the Battle Monuments Commission, presidentially appointed. Uh, it's not generally known, but uh, Ike Eisenhower was one of the original members in the 1920s. Uh, I think he was appointed by Calvin Coolidge, the first commission, went over and toured the battlefields where American soldiers fought, uh, Bella Woods, uh, Chateau Terry, the Argonne Forest, and, and others so that uh, veterans and their families and, and others uh, could see uh, uh, appropriate uh, monuments uh, uh, for the American soldiers and the other soldiers of, uh, of the Entente. So it's certainly highly appropriate uh, that there be uh, a, uh, a similar effort here in the nation's capital, uh, and this is uh, in keeping with, with that. Uh, also, I just want to make mention of the fact that in addition to the uh, soldiers who fought in, in Europe, uh, there were also uh, American soldiers who fought in, in Mexico. Uh, you know, following That probably was the proximate cause of America entering the war. You know that more, better than I do. You know, the Zimmerman telegram, uh, where the German government uh, uh, offered uh, or tried to get Mexico to enter the war, and uh, said, uh, uh, make war together, we'll make peace together, and, and so on, and dismember the United States. That probably had more of an impact in changing President Wilson's mind and the American public's mind from an isolationist approach to uh, uh, more uh, interventionist and, and led probably directly to a uh, declaration of, uh, of war. So uh, I am assuming that the 116,000 veterans uh, who are going to be... Uh, who gave their lives uh, will be uh, reflected in, in those who fought uh, in uh, on other fronts as well. Uh, in, in addition to uh, those who uh, were heroically uh, killed, uh, there are others that, like Alvin York, the uh, great American soldier, and, and others. And so perhaps some thought should be given to uh, commemorating uh, those who, uh, uh, who helped to, uh, to win the war by their uh, heroic actions, and as well as all of the others who tragically gave their lives in, in doing so as well. So that was my only thought. Mr. Chairman, I want to comment that over the years I've noticed that these memorials have some real challenges. First, you've got to properly remember whatever you're trying to remember. But the other point is you've got to find a way to bring people to it so they can be touched by it. And, and you can't always educate them so fully in, the, in, in a space like this, but some way to get them there so they will be touched, and then maybe they will research. The kids who come as tourists, the government workers who come will all will be reached and touched, but you got to get them there and you got to make it such that they will come, not just a, 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 a architecturally acceptable design, but something that will draw and be fu functional. And I think that's always a challenge. This is particularly a challenge.
Just a brief comment. I, I, I wanted to add to some of the what's been said, but um, first of all, I, I was really moved by the presentation today because I think the Commission uh, fully understands its responsibility and the weight that it has, uh, not only in, in looking at the existing, but then to uh, do a proper design. And I also just wanted to say specifically, I really appreciated Mr. Lewis's comments because I think he really embodied what the difficulty they are about to have, uh, and that is, we, in my opinion, I agree with him that, that we have an existing park that is isolated from all of its surroundings. It's inwardly focused, and how do you preserve some of those elements while creating something new? Uh, and I just wanted to, to mention that I, I fully appreciated um, their position and, and the way they conveyed it today. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Griffiths. Thank you. I think that concludes this information presentation. We'll move to the last item on the agenda, which is item 6B. It's also an information presentation. It's an update on the NIH Master Plan and Transportation Management Plan. We have Mr. Weil. We'll hear from NIH personnel. Master Plan this past April. And the plan was ultim ultimately disapproved since the master plan would have added an additional 1,000 employee spaces to the campus. And this new parking would have prevented the campus from moving closer to the 1 to 3 parking ratio goal, uh, which is set out by the NCPC comprehensive plan. In follow-up to the April Commission action, we've asked NIH to return with an update on the master plan parking uh, since Ms. Colleen Barros, the former Deputy Director for Management and NIH CFO, has proposed a new parking strategy for commission consideration. And with that, I'll now introduce Mr. Ricardo Herring, who is the NIH Director of Facilities Planning, who is here today to pre present NIH's new proposal in advance of their intended revised master plan submission for next month's uh, January commission meeting. Uh, with that, Mr. Herring. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Welcome, Chair. Mr. Herring. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chairman and members of the commission, I'm here to tell you, uh, here to show you the revised uh, parking numbers for the National Institutes of Health. Next slide. The previous master plan, April the 15th, uh, 2015, um, review proposed to add 1,000 net new employees parking spaces. Current proposal is to cap the existing level of employee parking at 9,045 spaces. Uh, the re a revised master plan, which reflects th this cap, will be submitted to NCPC for review January 2016. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Straightforward. Yeah. I know that our staffs have had ongoing dialogue over the last few months, and we're very appreciative of that, and we look forward to continuing to work very closely with you and your colleagues. Thank you, sir. So thank you very much for making your way down. Right. Thank Is you. there any further comments, any questions for Mr. Herring? Thank you, Mr. Herring. We stand adjourned. Thank you for your endurance today.